Welcome to the Laura Lee Show on tape. The following is my conversation with Val Valerian on the fourth dimension. This took place on radio station KVI Seattle on October 3, 1992. News and commercials have been edited out. Val Valerian is the author of Matrix 1, subtitled Understanding Aspects of Covert Interaction with Alien Culture, Technology, and Planetary Power Structures, and of Matrix 2, subtitled The Abduction and Manipulation of Humans Using Advanced Technology, and of Matrix 3, subtitled The Psychosocial, Chemical, Biological, and Electronic Manipulation of Human Consciousness. Val also publishes a monthly newsletter entitled Leading Edge. You can write to Val Valerian at the Leading Edge Research at P.O. Box 481 in Yelm, Y-E-L-M, Yelm, Washington, 98597. And if you'd like the complete catalog of The Laura Lee Show on tape, write to P.O. Box 3010 in Bellevue, Washington, 98009, or call area code 206 781 Now, here's Val Valerian. Valerian is our next guest. He's the author of three interesting books, Matrix 1, 2, and Just Out, Matrix 3. Uh, Val is the head. Welcome, Val. Thanks for joining us. Greetings. You've had such an interesting background in life thus far. Could you tell us a little bit about it and uh, what you've been doing and how you managed to get into the fields in which you find yourself these days? Well, uh, basically, um, I've been kind of, uh, ever since I was very small, I've kind of observed that uh, things changed, but they stayed the same, and uh, everything around me seemed to be kind of hypocritical in nature and I've always had a curiosity about uh, wondering why uh, what's happening is happening and uh, I uh, spent 18 months in Southeast Asia uh, uh, in 1970 as a combat photographer and I saw a lot of interesting things over there uh, a lot of uh, I saw some uh flying disks at rather close range uh, with the uh, U.S. military getting out of them. I saw some really interesting devices in use over there. Um, Such as? Besides, besides disk with, with armament um, coming out? A device... Uh, I saw the Army using this device. It was kind of a small rectangular box, probably about a foot wide and about three feet long, and they set it down uh, in this field in this black opaque curtain about 500 feet long just rose you know from the box and kind of obscured uh, a complete area it was like an electronic smoke screen or whatever it was it was something I'd never seen before and this was hmm. you know back in 1970 and um, a lot of other strange stuff you know went on over there so uh, this naturally piqued your curiosity oh well, yeah um, and after uh, a number of years, I ended up going down to Tampa, Florida, uh, where you know I was in the Air Force. I was a, a civil engineering assistant, a draftsman, surveyor, and site developer. And, and uh, I went to England in 1980, and that was about the time Bentwaters incident happened over there. Uh, Is that a UFO incident? Yeah, it's a, it's it's an incident that happened at the Ben Waters Air Force Base. It's the the incident that basically got uh, John Lear's attention uh, when he ran into several people that were uh, involved with that. And uh, I spent four years over there, shuttling back and forth between England and Belgium. And uh, in 1984, I uh, found myself in Nevada, and uh, things started coming to a head. So. Uh, after about three years, I gathered all the the most interesting material I could locate together, and I put it in a paper and brought it over to John's house because I, at that time, I was uh, John Lear. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, I was the section director for MUFON at the time, and uh, I said, "Here, I'll take a look at this." And he thought it was pretty neat, and he sent out ten copies, you know, to some of the people that he knew, and. Uh, 
I I titled it The Curl Tapers, um, and eventually uh, Arcturus Book Service got a hold of a copy and called me up and said, well, this is pretty neat, why don't you clean it up? And So I did, I cleaned it up and got carried away, and I wrote a 381-page book, which was uh, the first Matrix book. Why did you title it Matrix? What's the, what's the, how are you using it? Well, Matrix is kind of a uh, multi-hierarchical network of, of, uh, Events. Uh, the first matrix was called uh, "Understanding Aspects of Covert Interva- Interaction with Alien Culture, Technology, and Planetary Power Structures." Uh, I guess after being in England for about four years, I believe in calling some, a "rose a rose" as far as the title, and it seems like all my subtitles require extreme in-breath before pronouncing them. <laughs> um, well, you cover a lot of territory. Yeah, you uh, take big bites to chew off, don't you? Yeah. So I, I began working with net, uh, researchers worldwide after a while, and, and I um, kind of started a group called Nevada Aerial Research Group. And uh, between, uh, so this was like 1988 and 89 when I functioned as Nevada State Section Director for MUFON, and then after a while I realized that MUFON was kind of loaded with uh, ex-government military people, and and, uh, and I ran into several cases where they deliberately obscured data and everything else, so that's enough of this. Um, on, so, on the higher, middle, lower levels of MUFON? Or? On the higher levels of MUFON. Hmm. Um, so, you know, and then I have was appointed interim director for uh, UFO Contacts Interna- International until, they, until I start bringing out uh, evidence of negative or what they perceived as negative occurrences relative to what was happening to people and and they they were stuck in uh, basically uh, space brothers and flowers type uh, mindsets they said well we don't need you in here so Um, and I was also a member of the uh, APRO and the U.S. Speleological Association that's caving caving. Uh, a lot of stuff happens underground Uh, so then I write um, that down and have to ask you about that then, later. Uh, so then I just kind of started put stuff was coming in all the time, and I started putting a, a newsletter out called the Nevada, Nevada Real Research Newsletter. And then, um, then I then I in April '91, I or actually in February '91, I came up here to Washington to, to uh, lecture at Evergreen State College, and I said, this is pretty neat. It's not desert. There's you know, <laughs> it's, it's plant life in the air. You know, fog and Everywhere is a million miles from nowhere, but it's a lot better than the desert where I'd spent seven years. It's almost pseudo biblical, you know, being out there. So mm-hmm. I moved up here in April and changed the name of the uh, research network to Leading Edge Research Group. That's the name? Which uh, now has a network which spans about 40 states and 17 foreign countries. Um, so in the, the newsletter of Leading Edge is about 100 pages now. So. During all this time, um, relative to human alien interaction and human government interaction in the abduction area, I've probably um, worked with about 900 people since the very beginning. And, um, 900 people who have sighted or had alien interaction? Who have had concept? interaction with government, you know, very often interaction with uh, different types of uh, species. Uh, uh, occur where there are you or where there are humans present. Uh, U.S. government, uh, U.S. military, German military. This is quite happening, uh, you know, quite often, often enough to be significant. What is the significance? Well, there's some there's an upper level collusion going on. I mean, these uh, these military uh, are wearing black uniforms with a red triangle with a dragon on it, just like the uh, ETs that are on board there. And you've actually seen human military. In, in these alien uh, uniforms, I've seen I've seen this kind of thing go on, but not uh, on board the ship. I've seen things like uh, uh, people in mixed groups like that get out of ships from from a distance of three or four hundred feet. But I've this kind of theme is very consistent and running through a lot of people that I've worked with. So you've heard this story over and over again. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, in 1989, I I you know, and I knew a lot of people that were involved with this as well. So in, in 1989, I put Matrix 2 together, which was subtitled The Abduction and Manipulation of Humans Using Advanced Technology. In uh, 1990, 
that was released and that, that was updated to 660 pages in, in 1991. It's probably the most detailed work ever published. Um, it's the best book on the planet relative to that subject. Of alien abductions right. and, okay. And so in their intervening time, uh, I sort of turned inward and discovered that, you know, uh, I was the greatest mystery of them all. You know, uh, um, who am I? I mean, what am I doing here? And, so on and so forth, and I, and I locked into all that and went through a lot of uh, training and, and different kinds of disciplines and remote viewing and a lot of other things. And um, finally, in preparation for election in Los Angeles, where I went down there and uh, was a keynote speaker down at the UFO Expo West, in writing the in preparation for my lecture down there, I got carried away again and wrote a 913-page book. Because um, you're exponentially growing. It yeah. seems like that. Yeah. Called uh, Matrix 3, which is the psychosocial, chemical, biological, and electronic manipulation of human consciousness. So I guess all since 1988, uh, we've made, between the books and, and the leading edge, uh, we've made probably about 4,000 pages of material available to world researchers worldwide, which is more than any, you know, anybody else has done that I know. And um, I've got a degree in civil engineering and psychology, and um, that's really it in a nutshell. But um, we get stuff in all the time, and I do a lot of out of the body, out of the body travel. And do you, do you do that for the levels. purpose of research? You're saying, oh, gee, you know, what's going on in some of these uh, mysterious places that I can't get to physically? I'll just go there, uh, out of body, or do remote viewing. Is, is so for the purpose of research? Oh, yes. Okay, let's hear about I mean, I, that I, I, when we come back. Let's hear about okay. We need to take a break, and when we come back, we'll continue our talk with Val Valerian and see what uh, kinds of research he's done and get to some specifics on this. It can be some interesting uh, hours spent here tonight. I wanted to uh, have you tell us how you have used remote viewing and out-of-body experiences to do some research into your field. I've often been wondering why more people don't do that. I'm, I'm quite intrigued that... Uh, that you've been doing some of that. Well, it's you really have to use every method at your disposal, and, and all these different methods are easily verifiable uh, relative to you know going someplace and then going there, getting back in a body and dragging the body over there and looking through your eyes and yeah, that's that's there and going through the whole nine yards. Um, What's the theory behind it, as you understand it, that makes that possible? What, that makes what possible? Remote viewing. Well. Um, Everything's connected into, in certain terms, of the morphological field. Everything's uh, everything's connected together. And when you... See, our last guest was saying just that. Indeed. Um, when you lock into the lock into it, um, uh, you can take anything up. Uh, if you just give thought to it, it's, it's, it's one of these just-do-it things. Um, it, it's not hard to do. I, I, uh, I, I was sitting down... Uh, one day, for example, and I, my mind turned to George Bush, as it very often does, and um, I saw him eating breakfast, which I found was kind of odd because of the time of day until I realized he was in Spain at the time, well, and then it made more sense. Um, you know, it's, it, this is one of the government's uh, big things uh, uh, that they've been discussing, especially through... What, uh, remote viewing? Oh yeah, uh, the Psycor and all that, uh, and the SciTech uh, organization and General Stubblebine and all the rest of it, um, you know. And it, it's it's come out a lot through a lot of research, uh, especially in conjunction with uh, I Montauk stuff and um, which is the Tesla uh, uh, Philadelphia experiment. The Montauk right. There's, stuff? Okay. there's more about the more about the Montauk stuff and everything else in Matrix Three collectively than any other book in existence. Um, We've talked a lot about Tesla um, and the Philadelphia Experiment uh, with uh, various guests. I'd like to get your version of it as well. Uh, of the Philadelphia Experiment? Sure, and a few comments on it. You know, actually what I'd like to get well, is... Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just seems to me that there is a whole interconnectedness to a lot of the phenomenon and UFO events and sort of what's going on and maybe we have time for the big picture that you'd like to begin with. The big picture. No, um, kind of a chronological well, I think historical we, to really go to understand what the 
the Montauk experiment really means. Um, you really have to go back uh, 60,000 years and perhaps even a million years. Um, the, uh, you'll read in all the information um, that's in Matrix 3 and what um, Al Bielik and Preston Nichols uh, have published um, that in their time uh, the, their time uh, conversion equipment that they had in Arizona the time machine that they have and the other experiments they did out in Long Island they couldn't look beyond 2012 AD and they couldn't look beyond a million years ago and uh, they thought well it's a closed loop well, it is in a certain sense, but there's a lot behind that why they can't do that, that uh, that they have never brought out, and that uh, I know uh, Drumbelow has talked to Preston about it, and, and it just doesn't seem to sink in. Drumbelow's been on this show, too. Yes, he's quite a nice gentleman. Um, but it has to do with uh, something called the Merkaba. Uh, and it has to do with Mars, and it has to do with Atlantis, you know, which seems like uh, kind of far-fetched uh, connections with the Montauk experiment, and it has to do with greys. Uh, All those wonderful taboo topics. Yes, indeed. Uh, so it is, it's quite complicated. Basically, um, you could define the Merkaba as uh, a living field, Okay, uh, mm -hmm. generated from a living being, from a, from a body using emotion and love, and it involves spinning. Sort of a manifestation of the implicate order. Yeah, okay. exactly, exactly. Um, it involves taking the tetrahedral fields around the body, uh, one of which is fa is uh, phase locked to the physical, and spinning them. And uh, what this creates is a disc-shaped field that goes out about 55 feet around the body. Uh, and uh, if you spin this fast enough, uh, you change your basic wavelength of your, that your body operates and everything else, and from a third-dimensional view, you disappear. Now, this is the, this is the basic field of creation. Now, uh, which is the basic field? The this living about. field? Okay. Yes. Now, if you create this field externally, okay, mechanically, you can do that. You don't need love to do that. You just need intellect to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has to you really go back uh, 60, 70,000 years ago. After uh, Lemuria came up, uh, or Lemuria actually was starting to sink actually when it was... Uh, uh, the existence of Lemuria is pretty well established because of two main reasons. One being that coral gr only grows to about 150 feet below the ocean, and there's numerous coral rings all stretched over the Pacific from Easter Island to Hawaii, and the coral runs 1,800 feet deep. Which means that that coral was once only 150 feet below the surface, right. and so that land sank. Okay. And, all, and all the flora and fauna and bugs and insects and bacteria on all these islands are all the same. Right. And uh, there's a lot of reference and a lot of creation stories relative to that. And what happened was that uh, when, Atlanta, when uh, Lemuria, which was off in the, in the Pacific, uh, was in its final stages of sinking, Atlantis came up, and they they went to Atlantis, uh, the island of Atlantis, and Atlantis consisted of uh, about ten islands, one main island, one to the north, one to the south, and about six to the west, which just happens to be more or less where the Florida Keys are, but that area was actually underwater at the time, the area, the general area of the south, southern United States, and uh, the northern island was called Udall. And what they did is they they projected out uh, the tree of life over the over the main island in ten different vortexes or vortices. And um, what this did uh, was that basically in each one of these vortices had a different nature to it. And what it did basically was attract uh, the people from all over the planet, especially the people that uh, were in Lemuria. 
which basically had a core group of a thousand immortal beings, and I'll explain, explain about that later, um, to these areas. And each and people went to the area which was their greatest, uh, you know, in resonance with them. But there were two areas that were not of the nature of anybody there, and that those vortices just continued to spin, and they attracted two extraterrestrial races, one being the Hebrews, and nobody's quite sure where they came from, and the other was the Martians. So these Hebrews are relating Mars. to the Hebrews that we know from... Yes, okay. and, and another race was a race from Mars, which was very, very old. And which left behind Hoagland's um, face on Mars and all this. Yes, and, and the mathematical layout of the Cydonia complex is according to the Fibonacci spiral. Fibonacci spiral? Yes, yeah, and, mm -hmm. the and, and the mathematical layout describes exactly how they created the Merkaba. They created it using that facility. So what happened was, at that particular point in time, we have to go back a million years ago, when Mars was more or less like Earth, and um, they were all they were a left-brained, male-oriented planet, always warring with each other. And uh, just so the astrologers got the uh, planet of war right, didn't they? Right. Okay. And so, just before the atmosphere blew off, they uh, built. Uh, they did a, an experiment, built an external Merkaba. Now, this has been referred to by some sources as the Lucifer Rebellion because it uh, involves externalization of the Merkaba. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they built a time-space vehicle and got in it. And here they went along through time and space, and they looked ahead in the future, and there was this vortex. So they went into it. So they traveled through time and space and went into this vortex. Now, the, now, at the time, the people on Earth at that point, which consisted of uh, some uh, alien entities, uh, very tall ones, uh, they had 46 plus 2 chromosomes. Uh, humans have 44 plus 2. Oh, and they, these they are the skeletons of 7 and 8 and uh, such well, we're talking people that we taught? 12 we... to 14 feet. Uh-huh, okay. Um, uh, so, and these aliens were independent from the yes. the other groups. Okay. And so the the the, the consciousness at that time uh, was ver was equivalent to a twelve year old girl because the, the planet the planetary consciousness was female, right brain, very intuitive, very psychic. The Martian equivalent was male oriented, uh, left brained, and equivalent to a sixty five year old man. And in essence, they raped us. They said. You know, you're ours. But there weren't enough of them. There were only 1,000, 1,200 of them. Of who? Of the race that came from Mars. Mm -hmm. So they basically said, well, we'll try your feminine way. And they did for about 50,000 years. And during this uh, time, uh, we have to look at the, there's a, what's called the uh, procession of the equinox. Mm -hmm. Every 26,000 years, there's a shift in consciousness and a corresponding planetary axis shift. They're always synonymous. Every time there's a there's shift in consciousness, there's a shift in the axis. And we're talking about a pole shift? Yes. Okay. And there was a small shift at that particular time. In fact, it's about one twenty-six thousand cycle back. Hmm. And uh, a piece of Atlantis fell off, and it just happened to be the part where the Martians were. They were kind of aggravated about that. Hmm. And uh, later on, uh, and so there was kind of a general fear that went around Lance for a couple hundred years because they remembered what went on with Lemuria. It's and, thinking. Yeah. Okay. And so they were worried about, you know, maybe something would happen there because the reason why they were worried about it is because because of the influence of the Marsh, the race from Mars, they were becoming more logical, more left brain, and they were losing their psychic intuitive abilities. And then... Uh, why? Later, well, because of the influence of the Martian race. Okay. And so later on, um, so many, uh, I'll look up something here, so many years later, uh, about 16,000 years ago, an asteroid hit the Earth just about where Charleston, South Carolina is. And this can be backed up by any kind of ge geological records that you want to look at. Oh, sure. I'm reading about all the different sure. uh, craters left right. behind by various asteroids this, that you're this, finding. This covered four states. The equipment, of course, that was underwater at the time. And um, it uh, uh, 
they saw this coming because they were a very advanced society by this time. They, so they, they were, could peer into the future. Right. They were more yeah. advanced than this civilization is now. And the race from Mars, that aspect of it, wanted to blow it out of the sky. You notice the parallel to what's going on now with all this asteroid stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, people want to join AA, Atlantean Amnesiacs or something. <laughs> um, but uh, they wanted to blow it out of the sky, and, and the feminine half won over, and, said, and they had kind of a Dallas philosophy, you know, let it happen, you know. And so it did, and, and a big chunk of Atlantis fell into the sea, and it's just about the whole area where the Martians occupied. And so what they did is they, they basically said, you know, this is enough. We're not going to listen to you anymore. We're going to do our own thing. And they began to create another Merkaba experiment. This is the one that went haywire, and it, and it opened dimensional warps and pulled in billions of entities uh, from other dimensional levels, and billions of entities went into the bodies of the Atlanteans. And they're still here. In fact, uh, um, I was talking to a researcher not too long ago, in fact, um, in February, um, by the name of Dave, uh, David Herman, uh, who was, had been doing some interesting research which parallels this. And of course, if uh, people work with people who are psychotherapists and whatnot, uh, they're familiar with the idea of entities being in other entities. So today, um, very many people have four or five entities that are within in them. Now, if you can contain these in a octahedral field and hook it to their dimension, they look at they look at it like uh, the light of day, and they just go away. Uh, so, uh, in essence, by the race from Mars doing this, they brought the Lucifer Rebellion to Earth. And that's where things really went crazy, and so Atlantis sank. Um, how does the how does the continent sink? I mean, what was it? Uh, mountains in the first place? I mean, the whole thing just goes depressed. You know that the, the sea floor just was up and then it was down. It's, it's sunk how does it work? Well, it sunk. It, it sunk because of the. Uh, Turmoil, turmoil caused by the that Merkaba experiment going wrong. They lost control of it, and it ripped. O it's like ripping open your stomach lining. They, they, it ripped open dimension, uh, dimensional space. In that point, they had a very advanced crystal technology at that time. The, the Lemurian technology was more psychotronic in origin. Uh, Lemurian technology involves things where your mind and your heart and your emotions uh, connect with whatever the equipment is. Lemurian technology looks more like artwork than, than it does uh, equipment. Right. Um, you know, I was just in Maine recently, and they have that desert in Maine and a lot of places where you scratch off the, the topsoil and it's all sand. Yes. And so I'm just sitting, was sitting there trying to visualize, you know, what was this, the shore of some sea, you know, long ago? Sure. In, in a bigger, I mean, geography changes. It's kind of fascinating to track the history of certain pieces of geography. So the Greys got involved in this uh, somehow, and uh, everybody's sort of aware of the experiment uh, that was done in 1943 and 1983, and they're separated by multiples of 20-year cycles, which is the basic cycle of the Earth. And you'll notice that also falls on 2012. What's the purpose for the 20-year cycle? What is it? Uh, wh what cycle were they following? Uh, well, it's a cycle that occurs around August 20th every 20 years. It's just uh, it's a cycle of the planet. Well, it's sort of the harmonic convergence yeah. is around well, the time, in it? its own way, yes. Uh -huh. But it involves the, the planetary mind, as it were, and the planet uh, controlling the, the, the body. You know, the Earth is a crystalline structure. We're still learning more about that. But apparently there was also uh, a... Uh, so what the Montauk experiment was, was in essence creating an external Merkaba. The Greys were involved with it, and it wasn't just to make a ship disappear. Um, so there was an experiment uh, in 1913, 1943, 1983, and there will be another one around 2012. Okay, and and this is why um, they can't go. They couldn't in their time loop. They couldn't look beyond 2012. Because of this experiment? And they couldn't look beyond a million years ago because they were all connected. There are other things to do with 2012, too, but this is the fact that uh, we're, we're going into another dimensional octave. When, when people... Things have changed a lot. Uh, usually when people 
uh, die, as they term it, when they go out of their body for the last time. And I, I would advise that people are interested in that. Two good books are Journey Out of the Body by Robert Monroe and Far Journeys, especially this the second half of Far Journeys. It gives you really an interesting view on a lot of things. Well, we've had Bob Monroe on, okay. So when they, you have to understand that this whole universe functions on one wavelength, not frequency. Frequency is the number of vibrations. Cycles. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. But a wavelength, 7.23 centimeters. Everything from the macrocosm down to the microcosm. Okay? That's in this three-dimensional right. reality. And if you go to the next dimension, it's going to have some other wavelength. There are 12 dimensions, each, each with 12 overtones. Mm -hmm. Okay? The grays, uh, how they've come in here is they are sitting uh, one and two overtones above this one. So they're basically invisible to this wavelength. That's why we can't see mm -hmm. a lot of their stuff. The, the, uh, the skies are crowded one and two overtones above, above this one. When pe as they were saying, people, when people die normally, they go out of their body, they go to about the fourth dimension between a third and a sixth overtone and recycle back. Well, that's all over. Um, what do you mean that's all over? Well, because we are approaching the 26,000-year point in the procession. And oh, there's a major octave change here. Everybody is going. There's no more of this recycling stuff going to happen. Um, as I was explaining to people before, and, and within about uh, 10 years or so, 10 or 12 years, uh, most people who are relatively calm and center will be sitting on some grassy knoll someplace eating an orange they just thought of. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's so we're taking a major leap in consciousness. Yes. Um, so people talk about ascension and resurrection and all this other kind of stuff. They're well, sort of getting an intuitive message on this? I think so. Uh, ascension basically is going through this dimensional shift and going through it in your body with your eyes open essentially fully conscious and, and resurrection is you know the body dies you go out of it and you go there anyway um, or you fall asleep um, you're going to get there anyway but it depends on your state because if you're really a fear bound individual in the first place and, and you go to a situation which will be about the fourth dimension between the 10th and 12th overturns where what you think you get and you're a very chaotic individual well uh, you're going to have fear and then you're going to think of something and you're going to look at it and say well if I had a gun and you notice a gun there and you go in other words the, the people will get there but they won't necessarily stay there they'll resonate to another wavelength but uh, this oh and settle out to a place of comfort right that resonates with wherever you are right so the, the chaff mm -hmm. will, fit, will, will weed themselves out as it were in that way now this there are many different dimensions that as you know, they, they coexist simultaneously, but they're on different wavelengths. So there is a fourth dimensional Earth coexisting here at this same time, and it's already there, and it's beautiful. I've been there. How did you go there? Um, well, <laughs> that's kind of a, a long story. Do um, you want to finish this one first, and then you can it, tell us that one? It after. basically involves spinning your fields and, and going there, and I've, I've I've seen it on out of the body things too, and it's mm -hmm. it's basically the same as here, um, but it's uh, the colors are a lot more vibrant. But um, you know, it takes about two years to get used to the idea that you know what you what you think kind of comes into being, and and it takes a couple of years to get used to that. But I think people will generally be pleased. That's why you know, having written all this stuff about. Uh, uh, the government, the drugs, and the electronic mind manipulation, all these books about manipulation. When you start to look at consciousness itself, consciousness is the name of the game everywhere in the universe. So I kind of say, well, I've done all this stuff um, uh, on the sociocultural level and the level with the government and politics and all this stuff. Now it's a chance to say, well, um, you know, there are, there is other stuff that's involved with this. And um, I did that, in fact, up at the... Uh, the Disaster Preparedness Expo, which some people refer as Fear, Pain, and Victimhood Expo. And, and so I talked about this, and, and uh, my son was up there, and he said he was listening to a guy say, in, re in reference to me, he says, this guy's dangerous. You know, he must be a government agent. Because I wouldn't talk about all the other stuff that all the other people were talking about there, about 
fear, survival, and everything else. But, you know, I did put some slides from Matrix 3 up on the thing, and I, and I gave them something which described the book and everything. So if he bothered to read that, then I don't think he would have thought, thought that. You know, people uh, just need, you know, you can't really comment on anything at all unless it's in your experience. Otherwise, you know, you're just going on supposition. So a lot you don't of, have a reference point with which to understand it? I yes, guess. you have to have it in your experience. We're going to take a break and we'll come back and continue our conversation with Val Valerian. He's been telling us uh, quite an extraordinary story. And uh, we'll let him continue and explain, I guess you could call it a reconstruction of human history back a million years or so. And uh, this would be including a lot of anomalous and UFO uh, situations, sort of explaining all of that, I guess. Well, Val, what an extraordinary story that you just told us. How did you piece it together from various research, from other people's observations, from <clears throat> looking... Oh, it seemed to be a, a consensus, or how did the story grow? Uh, who, where did it come from? Relative to what, to Atlantis and all that? Um... I guess I'm saying, how does how did someone here in the late 20th century put together a story that would encompass um, a lot of history, the, of which there's a lot of hints, but there wasn't a direct uh, flow? I mean, you had to do some leap of imagination or, or something. Well, there, there's I mean, you a can lot. back it all up, but where did you get the basic storyline? There, there's a lot of stuff in, in, uh, in, in historical records, especially ancient Sumerian records. Um, and there's a lot of clues to it in Egypt, too. Uh, the problem in Egypt, though, is that uh, of the 2,000 Egyptologists, most of them are Muslims, which is fine. Oh, right. But Muslims don't believe that anything existed before 6,000 years ago, So because the Koran is based on that. So um, Unless you get a few renegade Egyptologists like John Anthony right. West. Yeah. But, I mean, there's been civilizations that have gone back 500 million years on this planet, uh, that's part of the suppression of, of human awareness is the suppression of uh, the continuity of the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the burning of all the libraries and everything like that uh, or is a good example. But they don't want people to know what has happened. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, lessons to be learned in wisdom and understanding about this whole planet. I found I mean, we go back 500 million years. I uh, found in search of episode where they talked about a geo that someone found. They sliced it open, and there was a hexagonal a uh, spark ceramic. Plug, Pardon? A spark plug, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and they took a uh, X-ray of it, and there was this whole device, you know, embedded in this um, 50 million year old rock. Well, how does this come to be? You could ask. You know who does uh, some really good books is. Uh, David uh, Childress, mm -hmm. his Lost Cities uh, series, and very good books, and he has a pretty good grasp on things, but not a complete grasp on some things. Um, he looks at the, for instance, on, on one of his books, um, he has a picture of Queen Nefertiti, and of course, uh, they're all shown with this long, tall hat on, or headpiece on. Right. That's because they had an elongated skull. They were Assyrians. No, this uh, is Nefertiti married to Akhenaten, who right. is depicted they in pictures. They were 12 to 14 is... feet tall. They, they had 46 oh. plus 2 chromosomes. They were Syrians. Uh, you know, that, uh, there are several species of several races from the Syrian system. Well, could, uh, could if someone go back and take a mummy that was this tall? I mean, maybe they were most of the pharaohs at that, in that era were mummified. And look at the genetic material, and would you find 46 plus 6 chromosomes? 46 plus 2, yes. Plus 2, okay. Yeah, there's, uh, well, 42, 42, uh, 42 plus 2 chromosomes do exist here. Uh, they're mainly found in some African tribes and some are Aborigines. They've already been checked. We're 44? 44 is most people, uh, and 46 plus 2 is, is the unity Christ consciousness uh, uh, mode, as it were. And there, there is a morphological grid for each one of these chromosomes. There's a morphological grid for every species on this planet of everything. It extends from about 60 feet under the ground to about 60, feet, 60 miles out. And there's three grids which suit that DNA structure. And the, the 46 plus 2 grid is, was necessary to be established for everybody on the planet to go into Christ consciousness. And that's, you know, that's just, that's another thing. But with each particular um, chromosomal uh, layout, there's also a uh, height variation as well. Uh, there, there's a height 
uh, so the more chromosomes, the taller you are, basically. Well, yes. Uh, specifically, when you're 42 plus 2, the height range is 3.5 to 4.5 feet high. Now, that would be the grays, then. Um, um, possibly. Of course, that hasn't been checked, but they were originally uh, looked more humanoid than they did, than they do. Uh, but of course, the grays are very left-brained and totally logical. That's why they've been doing all the mutilations all this time and pulling the sexual organs out of cows and all this other thing and, and mutilating humans and other animals that... Are you using well, cows for genetic material? Well, some of them do, but primarily they... They understand the idea of love logically because they're left-brained, okay? So they're trying to analyze... They just have sexual, trouble experiencing it. Right. They're trying to analyze the idea of sexual energy and, uh, and the idea of love, but they're trying to do it logically. They don't have an emotional complex. They're a left-brained species. They're trying to breed that into themselves? So they already have. Uh, they, they've, they've had a crossbreeding thing, and it is successful because there is another species... Um, the Esasani, which have traveled uh, through time, and, and they are a result of blending with human species. They, they, they couldn't, they, they can't make this jump into the, into the fourth uh, dimension. They can't make the leap that we are all going to make. Oh, well, they must be terribly jealous. Well, so they had no choice but to try to create a genetic blend to put some of them, some of self through there. Oh, I see. So most human beings are. 44 plus 2 chromosomes, and that ranges from about 5 to 7.5 feet. 46 plus 2, the height range is around 10 to 16 feet, and here's where you get the Nephilim that uh, Sitchin described. Oh, yeah, okay. And the, the, the Syrian race, which were the long skull, or the long skulled races, and, and this is described in all over the world. Everywhere in the world you have depictions and stories statues of giants and little people everywhere um, mm. and so you also have the Hathor uh, species from Venus but they aren't they don't occupy the third dimension which is why they aren't detected there's a lot you know there's a lot of simultaneous dimensions going on here so I mean you can't if you use an empirical base empirical reductionist technological situation you're not going to be able to detect that if you use three-dimensional lenses to view the world strictly, then you're going to miss a lot. The okay. most advanced species have no external technology. It's all internal technology. Well, if they have their consciousness developed to the point, to its utmost, you would think they wouldn't really need technology consciousness no, to function No, because them. they can create anything they wish. Yeah. Actually, we have a phone call from Scott in Burian, and if you have any other uh, phone uh, calls... Uh, questions you'd like to pose or comments you'd like to make, 421-5757 is the number. In King County, in Pierce County, that number is 751-5757. In Snohomish County, 348-5757, star KVI for cellular one phone. Scott in Burien, hi, thanks for joining us on 570. KVI, you're talking with Val Valerian. Yeah, thank you, Orly. Sure. Uh, you touched on part of the question I was going to ask. I wanted to know where some of the uh, ancient cultures mainly... Uh, the Egyptians, uh, the Mayans, and the Essene uh, fit into this picture. Uh, also, I heard him, uh, right now I'm studying ceremonial magic, and it's very deep into the Kabbalah, and uh, I heard him talking about the Tree of Life, and I was wonder wondering if he could expand on a lot of that. Uh, well, uh, there are several distinct possibilities relative to the Mayans, and and, and all that, uh, but the but what we've been able to work out is they and the Egyptians is they they all originally uh, migrated from Atlantis um, when it it began to sink, um, and basically there were this core uh, there still was a core of. Uh, a number of immortal beings. Now, immortality doesn't mean existence in a body forever. That's a trap. What it means is continuity in consciousness and memory. If you are in Christ consciousness, uh, or in unity consciousness, perhaps is a better word, um, you can do anything. You can choose when you're going to leave the body. Um, so there was basically, you know, the Egyptian... Uh, the Mayan culture 
and the Egyptian culture was were both set up by Thoth, uh, who was one of those immortal beings. In other words, he you know he, he physically he could not go out of the body or die from a third dimensional viewpoint unless he wanted to, and uh, so he's he in fact he really uh, ran Atlantis for some. 16,000 years uh, and he was all over the place um, there's another aspect that has been mentioned relative to the Mayans and that's uh, what Jose Arguilla mentions and not in the um, Mayan factor but in his book Surfers of the Zavoya oh I enjoyed that book uh, that he mentions uh, uh, the Mayan as being uh, a planet uh, and the uh, that's kind of interesting we're trying to track that down but uh, that's basically what that's so the planet in the Pleiades involved constellation in now the tree of life the tree of life um, is can be generated and can be seen in the sacred geometrical figure of Metatron's cube um, I'm not familiar to, with Metatron's cube what is that uh, I'll send you one <laughs> a drawing of it it's, it's basically a two dimensional de de depiction of a three dimensional uh, uh, representation that is the seed for everything. Um, everything can come from that. It's the seed of creation. Um, and really, to understand all this, everything, you have to go very, very deep in, into uh, a study of uh, history, consciousness, neurophysiology, everything. You have, to be, you have to be the supreme eclectic type of uh, leaning and you really have to be wanting to know who you are and, and what everything is about. Not anything else? Um, I was just uh, wondering. I, I I can feel the shift that's coming on that everybody's talking about here. That, you know, the big shift happening in 2012. I can, right. especially people, here in the Northwest, it's very People strong. in general, Scott, but, over the past uh, year or two have been feeling more... Uh, more and more psychic, if you will, impulse. We're picking up on more things, and to the degree that they are doing this, uh, the powers that were uh, are trying to uh, have been trying to suppress this, uh, both by you know, putting stuff into the food, water, electronically, and otherwise. I mean, look at the cellular telephone system, for instance. 840 to 8, 890 megacycles. That just happens to be the same resonant frequency of the human skull. These people know what they're doing. Mm. Um, oh, um, the last question I have is uh, to make this shift in humankind, I guess, easier on more people. What what would your suggestion be? Well, they're gonna they're gonna go through it anyway whether they like it or not, whatever new world order that's going to exist in whatever form it's going to exist is going to be very short-lived. What, uh, to make it un, un, easy for people in general, I guess the best advice that I could give is learn how to become calm and centered within yourself. And uh, uh, read Matrix 3. <laughs> mm -hmm. Go Understand that social consciousness operates from the first three structural areas of the brain. Okay, involving uh, uh, security, sensation, power, and fear. Oh, our, our amphibian brain, so to speak. The reptilian so, brain is reptilian the first brain. brain. Thank you. Okay. So, if you can really get rid of the idea of fear and become more conscious and aware, sure, you're going to do it on a, on a cultural level. You're going to do it on, on a political level. You're going to under, understand what's going on around you. But that's the first step. The second step is to become more conscious. To become a conscious being, to get out of this uh, uh, sleeping thing. Well, this really relates to our last guest's uh, theories too. I mean, the two are, seem to be jazzing on the same concept what? here. Jazzing on the same concept here. Um, you know, almost, shifting almost consciousness. Almost exactly. Yeah. Uh, they're very close. Uh, I'm glad you noticed that too, Scott. Yes, uh, I was sitting back thinking about that. Uh, so we're all trying to become more than human, basically. That's what's happening. No, you see, we're not not—we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. What are we? We're spiritual beings having a human experience. Uh-huh. It's a whole different directional. Indeed. 
you, you, can, you can engage the social drama to whatever level that you wish. In, in, another term, in other terms, it's a game, okay? It's a learning experience, and through your experience, you gain wisdom, which doesn't have a polarity, and from that you gain your personal truth. Okay, everybody wants to know what's disinformation, what's true, what's not true, and, and you know what people believe. Uh, don't believe anything. You know, <laughs> beliefs have nothing to do with experience. If you experience something, then you know it. There's a big difference there. If, if, if you believe, well, you, can, so, you, can you believe something, you can be manipulated. You know. But I guess you have the experience, and then you're going to need to interpret it somehow. You're going to need to make reference to it. You're going to need right. to understand and, and it. That's part of the part of the deal because uh, when you're trying to interpret the experience, what do you interpret it with? You interpret it with previous experience, and that previous experience is loaded with predispositions, beliefs, conflicting beliefs, baggage. a whole bunch of baggage, mm -hmm. and things out there and this might seem kind of a strange way of saying it, things out there have absolutely no meaning except the meaning that you give it. So, I mean, two people could look at something. One says it's good, one says it's ugly, one says it's Republican, one says it's Democrat. But it isn't any of that. It simply is. And so the you meaning really you project out on it, you have to understand how consciousness works. And if people really understood who they were, they wouldn't do what they do to each other. And that's why everything political, all this political stuff on that level is really a no thing in the end. I mean, what, what is voting? Go out and vote. What's vote? What's, what is voting? Voting is say, saying, govern me. There's no provision made in this culture for people to become autonomous. I guess you have to go figure out a way to do it on your own. That's well, true autonomy, it, then. It's happening already. Uh, there's... The, you know, um, Christ consciousness, um, if, if a planet is in unity consciousness, it doesn't need a government, per se. Uh, or at least a very different one. Scott, does that uh, answer your questions, and do you have any others? Oh, i got millions of questions. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Ask a couple more. It's fine. Um, the last uh, guest that was on was basically saying that uh, a lot of the social ills that are happening in our world today are... Uh, experientially there to teach us uh, yeah. uh, lessons of some type. And, Wisdom. And I'm exactly at that same point also. That, uh, And that's what you're saying, I think, also, that you can't learn anything without an experience of it. Yes. So uh, I was wondering if you would comment on that. People very often get tied up in the idea of good and bad, positive and negative. But what they're there for, being part of one thing, is for timing. The timing is always perfect. Push ahead, retard, push ahead, retard. Or you could say... The timing factors. They say that's how we walk. You know, one foot rests while the other one moves, and that one rests while the other one moves. Yeah, the difference on, on a cultural, political level between the idea of positive and negative is that positive acknowledges the, the whole being value of self and, and spirit, if you will. The negative polarity... Uh, attempts to replace that with ego aggrandizement, okay, for security, sensation, and power. And that's exactly what all the media and all the cultural programming and everything circulates around, is is aggrandizement of the ego or the alter ego. And that's What's what Vern says, it's just feeding on its own pathology. It's just perpetrating the pathology. And Yes, and, and deep down inside, people know, they know something's wrong. They, they have an essence. They suspect certain things, but having no other reference point, they're not willing to make that little leap. They shouldn't be afraid to make that leap. They are the path, you know. They they have more in common than they suspect. You know, consciousness is the name of the game, not politics. Well, then what's stopping people? A lot of people are being stopped, well, and the paradigm shift is, you know... Because they have fear. They're, 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 they're basically culturally conditioned and... Well, by the name of your book, you would assume that you believe that we have a little help in maintaining fear, having a little encouragement from outside. Um, yes, uh, from part of the negative hierarchical structure, yes. Perpetrating itself just in its own dynamics? Yes, I mean, they're, it, it's, they're trying to cause as, as many unaligned people to align themselves in that direction, to supply more energy to that resonance, as it were. 
<coughs> but that resonance is self-defeating. Is it a conscious situation on their part, or is it just part yes, of the it, dynamics yes, of that mindset? It's a, it's a mindset? perfectly conscious situation on their part. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you really have to understand what the positive-negative hierarchy thing is all about. And, that, and a good friend of mine, Michael Topper, um, uh, wrote some very good material, material on and that's in Matrix 3, too. And you really need to understand what that's about, what the idea of positive and negative conceptually is about while you're viewing everything dualistically in order to really understand what unity means. Could you give us just a hint and then we'll move on? A hint with what? <laughs> what you just explained, positive and negative and what duality really means and what unity really means. Well, positive and negative are actually a part of one thing. Right, two sides of the same coin. So yes, sort of essentially. Idea. Okay. I mean, if, um, it's like uh, the only way, uh, uh, like I said, if people only know who they were, they wouldn't do what they do to each other. The only way the consciousness of all that is everywhere, if you would call that the creator, could can maximize and differentiate the number of probable ways to evolve its, itself is to manifest itself from as many points as possible simultaneously. Sure, if it's omnipotent and omnipresent, then that's easy for it to do, right? So part of it comes through one body, manifests the personality when reacting to the environment. Another sort of comes through another body, but it's the same root consciousness. Okay, you can only see in other people what you what you what's in you. Otherwise, you wouldn't recognize it. Right, no point of reference. Okay. Yeah, and so when these people are out here and they're, you know, a lot of people that uh, come across things, they just don't want to hear anything. They don't want to hear about anything because they. They're afraid. They don't have any other reference point. If they don't have the social, cultural consciousness thing, they don't have anything. Because the faction that wants to control and manipulate identifies with control and manipulation. And if it doesn't have that, it doesn't have identity. Okay. Okay? And it doesn't want to lose identity. So that's why you see polarization happening. I mean, to me, it means, to me, I see the one paradigm happening and, and a lot of lot of growth in that direction but at the same time you see the old guard s squeezing even tighter hanging yeah, on even and this, tighter and it's happening now because we're approaching this 20 the end of this 26,000 year period we're going into a major shift uh, for the planet as well but for the all the entities on this planet into a different octave and we'll hear more about that when we come back. We're going to rejoin Val Valerian just after the news. I'm Laura Lee, and you're listening to 570 KVI. We have one line open. That's our Snohomish line. The number is 348-5757 if you'd like to join us. Back in just a moment. Back, and uh, the phone lines are quite busy. We better get to those phones and start with Kent in Olympia, who's calling long distance. Hi, Kent. Thanks for calling. Hi, Val. I was uh, listening to you, and is your Matrix series based on the psychic material worlds or the illusionary worlds? And does it, or have you done any research or composed any any thoughts on paper about um, what I would, I guess, I would call soul level and above? Um, the answer to your first question is no. Uh, is any kind of totality and the second question yes uh, and I was just about to get into that actually see what synchronicity uh, happens indeed. in the show <laughs> me? you picked that up <laughs> I was about to get into that well the other thing is that you know I didn't know what Vern was going to talk about and I didn't know what you were going to talk about except only very vaguely and it so surprises me when things all kind of coalesce and you know, hear the same message there's a lot it more over and over. there's a lot more when you talk about psychosocial aspects it, it goes beyond cultural level it starts going into a lot of other things and I was going to talk about that uh, which would take a little while but uh, before I do that uh we can have more questions. Great. Ken, do you have any other questions for Val? Uh, yes, I do, actually. Go ahead. Um, just getting warmed up here. Okay. Uh, the, on your saying, uh, the, the first step as you see it, or as, as I'm interpreting you, is letting go of race consciousness, or, and that, of course, is race consciousness of the planet, and then it goes on to a galactic or third dimensional race consciousness. Oh, well, you, not precisely. You have the general idea, though. Uh, 
I think uh, as a reference uh, for what you really are talking about, uh, I would read uh, some of Robert Anton Wilson's books, primarily uh, uh, quantum physics or quantum technology. Are you familiar with his work? Okay, check it out. Uh, Robert Anton Wilson. Uh, he does a very good Prometheus, Prometheus Rising. I would highly recommend to answer your question. But in answer to your question, we're well, could you we're speak going into we're, we're going in and getting in touch with uh, neurogenetic uh, consciousness. Uh, I'm getting kind of an echo here. We are. Um, tell you what, Kent. Why don't we have you finish your questions? I think we've got a funny, fuzzy phone line, and then we'll. We're, have we're you going dimensional up. here. There we go. Can't you have anything else? And then uh, yeah, there's a book okay. called The Keys of Enoch. Yeah. And in it, some of the material I found very interesting as it rang an intuitive bell, and is what you're associating this whole change on the outer level related to the shedding of the RNA DNA molecule and the information being fed mm. to the neural or the the nervous system. Essentially, what you say is. Reasonably correct, yes. Uh -huh. I didn't understand that, so I'm going to have you repeat that in just a moment. But I'm sure also, Val, there's a book list that you could send us that would be very useful. Kent, could you explain what you meant, and then I want to hear Val explain what you... I didn't get that one. Well, what I... What I uh, there's a part of the book in the Keys of Enoch uh, that, uh, to me, I interpreted as... Because for me, everything that happens out, outwardly is just a mirror. Uh, as Val was mentioning earlier, there are technology. Right. Um, and, people, and the races that do left brain work, to me, is, it, it's a mirror of what we can do within ourselves uh, without the technology. However, technology is the first stepping stone to realizing that through the mirrors. Uh, and also that as, we've, as the involutionary process uh, coincides with the evolutionary process, our internal RNA, DNA molecules shed um, old ideas, as it were, and this in turn um, releases new information on how to actually raise our vibration. Well, that's how I understand it at this point, and I really... That's so it can change the, the miasms around it, kind of the, the energetic uh, message around it, you mean? Well, to my understanding, it, it just increases the frequency and the vibration of our uh, our molecules, and atoms. You're, you're basically what you're doing is you're tapping into the higher brain structures uh, as a consciousness filter, uh, uh, the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh brain structures. So you start vibrating on that before you actually leave there. Right. Okay. Kent, wonderful question. Thanks for calling. I appreciate that. Okay. Thanks. Um, Anything else you want to add before we take the next call, Val? Oh, go ahead. 4215757 is a line that's now open. We'll take our next call from Harry and Redmond. Hi, Harry. Thanks for joining us. Yes, hello, Laura Lee. Uh, Val, well, most certainly a uh, fascinating discussion, and uh, I can relate to uh, a great deal of what you have to say. Uh, the Merkaba, for example, and the rotation of the tetrahedral fields might sound a little far out to some people until you encounter them yourself. Uh, I'd like to shift over a little bit and ask you for your opinion of the uh, current enigma of the crop circles and the harbingers of world change, if you're familiar with that, and maybe the interpretations of Isabella Kingston. Yes, uh, I'm familiar with that. Uh, All right, I'd like to have your comments. Synchronistic would become familiar with just about everything fairly quickly, uh, <laughs> whether I like it or not. We also had Isabella on the show not too long ago. Oh, you did? Yeah. I missed that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of interpretations relative to that. Um, what is your feeling about the, uh, the crop circle and the uh, and uh, so forth and that? Well, uh, the most interesting work uh, that I have seen relative to the crop circles is the work done by Ralph Noyes. By Noyes, mm -hmm. yes, uh, crop circle enigma. And what he has discovered in here uh, is that uh, the crop circles uh, have uh, energy-based connections to. Uh, the earth grid, specifically to ley lines, and, and, and he really uh, goes into a lot of very interesting work mm -hmm. discussing different kinds of energy lines, uh, uh, whirly lines, different uh, multiple ley lines, uh, uh, really interesting uh, work. And it really seems to be manifesting... Uh, 
uh, seemingly as an expression, it's an expression of intelligence, whether it in fact is part of the Earth's uh, planetary mind manifesting certain geometric aspects, or it is another species trying to do this for a specific reason is completely, is, is not quite clear at this particular point. Actually, Gerald Hawkins says the same thing. He says the certain circles express the diatonic music scale and Euclidean geometrics. They're inherent in the ratio of the patterns. Now, whether they're human or alien is of a question he can't answer, but right. he can tell you that they're obviously intelligent and they know a lot of math. Right. Uh, and, the, and the most interesting one recently was the one that was... Uh, uh, um, Z squared minus uh, uh, lambda. Uh, what, basically, what that is is the Mandelbrot pattern. There was a, 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 a series of crop circles in the Mandelbrot right, pattern. Right, coming up recently, yes. Right. Uh, you know, obviously, if you're trying to gain attention, uh, whatever it is, is trying to gain human attention on higher, higher levels of expression. Mm -hmm. Is that related at all to uh, the Matrix 3, which I have not read yet? I'm going to pick up. But uh, do you treat this? Uh, no, I don't really discuss that in there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all these things progress, uh, you know, with evolution of consciousness, generally my own, and uh, and other people that, uh, you know, we interact with, so uh, on all different levels. Uh, so it, it just depends on what appears to be appropriate to inject into the civilization at any specific mm -hmm. time in order to create the desired effect. Okay. Uh, basically of saying, well, people appear to be ready to understand this or that, so it's put out. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we say a similar message on a lot of different levels, sure. might get through. Yeah. Sure. Harry, thanks for your call. All right, Shirley, thank you. Thank okay. you. Bel Margaret in Bellevue, hi. Thanks hi. for joining us here on 570 KVI with Val Valerian. Okay, good evening. Um, I had a question that popped in my mind as you were talking a while back. I want to, I like to do really specific questions because Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I could get on for 20 minutes. And, but um, how does one protect oneself against um, electromagnetic pollution? Well, on certain levels, uh, there's two, two main levels to look at this at. One on the level of uh, awareness on another level of consciousness, which you know, I might have to explain that. Um, Why don't you go ahead and do that? Uh, on a level of awareness, it's understanding what is going on. Understanding, and, and there's most, of, there's more stuff on that in Matrix Three than any other book on the face of the planet. So um, that again, I didn't hear. I just, I was, you weren't speaking loud enough. In other words, understanding what's going on, what is being done electronically, uh, how it's being done, why it's being done. In other words, becoming aware of it. That's the first step. I mean, just intellectually. Well, yes, okay. in understanding. Eyes the, open, yeah. The second, the second uh, step would be uh, taking, uh, if you want to shield your uh, brain uh, from different things, you could, um, you know, use common precautions like uh, maybe line line a wall with uh, with sheet of copper foil or. Sleep in a fair day. Well, no, yeah. if you're going to have a spring mattress, uh, put a piece of uh, aluminum screen between the spring mattress and your and your uh, uh, your box mattress and your. What would that mattress. do? What would aluminum screen do? Well, the springs, you know, the springs in the mattresses are specific dimensions which are standardized, and they act like little antennas, and oh. they pick up stuff and they radiate people during the night. They're, they're they're gauged to be specific So you're probably in resonant with everyone else that has the same sort of spring magnets. Or ma uh, um, well, we're talking, springs we're in getting it. into to scalar areas and some other things that are going on. Uh, you know, there are certain precautions that you can take. Now, moving to the other area, consciousness itself, uh, embodying basically the, the tachyon area, functions at around 10 to the 65th cycles per second, if you could convert to cycles per second. And tachyon refers to? Well, it's it's basically an energy that's alive with consciousness itself. Okay. So a lot of these effects that they're doing electronically uh, depend on hyperspatial fields. In other words, fields that are 90 degrees rotated from the, from, uh, the electromagnetic field. And so in order to overcome uh, this, you have to overcome the upper uh, 
the higher order frequency. You have to be resonating at a frequency higher than the higher order frequency that's manifesting itself, uh, you know, hyperspatially as an effect. Uh, you have to get higher than the stuff that they're beaming out, as it were, in resonance. Oh, I see. Affected so, because so, you're on a different frequency. Right, and you're becoming aware of yourself. You're, you're becoming aware. Gee, did that thought come into my head? That doesn't belong there because you know yourself. You're clear. You're at peace inside. And, you know, that's part of it, too. Um, so consciousness itself becomes a defense, you see. So you can look at it on many different levels. Uh, it's fairly well explained in the book, but, uh, you know, we're always uh, endeavoring to explain things in, in various ways to make it well understood. So they're not, um, they're not capable of mechanically or whatever they're using, um, creating these, these, um, this, this, uh, this dissonance at these higher frequencies? Uh, who's not? They're not capable of what now? Well, um, my understanding of what you're saying is that um, there's a conscious and deliberate attempt to um, kind of to, to weaken us by, uh, by creating this electromagnetic pollution. And yes, but that's that's one aspect of it in the environment. The other aspect is is direct, purposeful uh, irradiation of the populace on certain frequencies to manifest physiologically through the different fields surrounding to the the body. Um, yeah, I can the, feel that real fields strongly. Are, the it, fields surrounding the body uh, uh, variations and impacts on those fields manifest themselves after a certain period of time physiologically, and they yeah. know how to do this. Yeah, every, I can... auric, every auric band around, if you look at that particular envelope and that particular geometry, every band has an access frequency, okay? And they can entrain stuff in resonance on that frequency and affect the body on a cellular resonance level. What's an example of a manifestation that happens from that certain uh, resonant level that, that's being engineered? I get the cold. Um, I get cold. Weakening of the immune system uh -huh. is one. Okay. Uh, suppression of psychic ability is another um, you know, they don't want people to evolve they want to maintain control you know that's the way that uh, they have basically an Orion based mentality when it comes to this so this is not the only planet that's ever had trains blows, trains, boats, planes flying saucers and people in black suits with fedoras you know this is, this is not the only place that's ever had that this, is, this basic structure of this culture is not from here that's why it seems so unnatural in, in very many basic aspects to it. I mean, they replace uh, the, the, the uh, you know, money is tied into the survival mode, to, to tied into the survival-based areas of the brain, and they've really got everybody on a hook here. So in a sense, when you hear people, people like Peter Russell who say, you know, look at the way that cities manifest and grow, it looks exactly like a cancer cell. You, you know, quite literally, you're saying it's like the Earth caught a virus. And it's starting to take over, or it took over. Well, again... And reproduced the, itself. I mean, you could say metaphorically, in a sense. This, the situation, it might seem sort of anthropomorphic. In other words, looking at everything from a human point of view, uh, what I'm going to say here. But what's going on here, on this planet now, is something that's never gone on anywhere else. And that's why it's attracting so much attention from everyone. Um, because there's a resolution of polarities... Uh, that is coming to fore to the fore right now that has to be resolved before this octave leap and there are a lot of species here that are that are involved with it on one level or another that are here to do that as well so that you know it's, it's quite it's, it's a very it's a precedental situation um, here on many different levels and if you just look at everything from a, from a get up and go to work uh, social consciousness mentality, you'll never understand it. You know, there, there's, you have to get more conscious as a collective civilization on the mass consciousness, and that's basically the reason why uh, we and, and many others have been injecting these understandings out there. Uh, so people who are predisposed, and they're becoming more predisposed as more people are becoming predisposed because of the morphogenic field, They'll pick up on this. Margaret, anything else you want to ask? Well, I, I want to follow up again. I didn't quite understand. Now, he said that um, 
the the uh, the radiation that's being directed at us is designed to keep us keep us down. So well, docile. And um, and you you say the way to protect ourselves from it is to rise up above it. But I thought the whole point of of radiating is, is to keep us from rising above us. So how do you, know, you get out of the catch twenty two? How do we protect ourselves when we're still here? Well, it, it it depends on well. You can engage on engage it on a on a mass to mass level by interposing different substances between you and it, as I mentioned before. Okay. But if you align yourself and work on you, who you are, uh, and start raising your consciousness, start activating those higher brain centers, then it will have less and less effect because you'll become more and more aware of what it's doing physiologically and otherwise. Okay, mm-hmm. that's in your Matrix 3 book? Pardon? That's in your Matrix 3 book? Yes. Are you talking about that? Uh-huh. Okay. Well, something it needs like, to be talked about more, but I mean, it was, it's, it's basically there, yes. So something as simple as uh, Hatha Yoga could, I mean, its purpose, one of the purposes, besides sort of giving you a chiropractic adjustment yourself, is, you know, to start aligning those higher centers, right? So, I mean, there's, historically, there's a lot of uh, systems and methods and tools to use. Would you say, Val? Yes, definitely. Okay. Margaret, thanks for the call. Thank Appreciate it. Todd in Tacoma. Hi, thanks for joining us. You're on 570 KVI. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, I have a question that you talked about something probably about an hour ago, uh, experimenting with livestock, sexual organs. Yeah. And um, I was under the impression I'd heard a while back that um, the Atlanteans used to breed in seasons, just like animals come into season. And I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate on that or if you've heard of that. Well, this goes back a lot farther than that. It goes back to about 200,000 years ago. Okay. And even, even Well, it even goes back, actually, well, primarily later than that, back in Lemurian times. There was a lot of, don't forget, there were two, there, was, there were humans who were basically bred 200,000 years ago, and they were used partially to work the gold mines. Okay, now that's Africa. coming from Sitchin, right? Right, okay. and other sources. Uh, the gold was primarily used by... Uh, uh, the species that comes around that Schutzen mentions every 3,500 years. On the planet Huron? The, well, the Marduk. Oh, okay. Because uh, they have had a problem with their atmosphere, and uh, a, a gold, molecular gold suspension was the way in the atmosphere was a way to fix that. And so they needed to mine a lot of gold. Um, gold is, uh, depending on whatever uh, isotope you use, is a valuable substance all over the because of its characteristics. And uh, so um, humans uh, were also used in, the, in, in a place called Eden, which is E.D.I.N., which was actually in southern Iraq at the time. But at that time it was uh, more like a jungle-type atmosphere. And what this thing was that uh, the tree of good and evil was is that... Um, Humans learned how to sexually reproduce, and they didn't want humans to do that um, because they wanted to continue the creation. They wanted to continue to uh, essentially breed humans out of the laboratory. And, and, and moving ahead to a Lemuria, they did a lot of skeletal and cranial work on uh, humans at that particular time. And um, there's been a lot of a lot of activity. Uh, with humans and other species, uh, again, later on in Atlantis. As genetic work, uh, you know, once you start learning about all this stuff, the temptation to go and uh, go throw together anything you wish to do. I mean, it, it's not really well, we... a bad thing to do. It's, it's trying to, it's part of the, part of the wisdom behind the, the, the uh, efforts of creation as you start to gain consciousness that you, you create in different ways. And it's part of the wisdom in there. It's not necessarily a negative thing, but there's a lot of wisdom to to how and what you do and when you do it. That that is constantly being learned. And just like with the this, this, this thing with the asteroids, where they're talking about asteroids coming and we're going to shoot them down with SDI or whatever, that's an Atlantean remnant coming up. And so is the the genetic stuff that's going on now. It's a repeat. So here we are back in the same ball game. Maybe we'll get it right this time. Well, it's going to get itself right for us. You see, that's 
it's kind of working itself out. So if that's inevitable that we're going to get it right this time, then your motivation for getting your consciousness more aligned with this universal, intelligent, implicate order would be, at least you're going to have an easier ride and a easier, easier go of it while yeah. it's happening. Yeah. And probably contribute to the ease of the next person as well. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, who are we talking with? Todd? Uh, yeah, anything uh, else? Yeah, um, the mining the gold, I guess, gets to my next question. That with what we hear about now, that we're going to have to stock up, stock up on gold to barter with aliens. <laughs> is there any truth to that, or could you elaborate Where on that? Well, that? truth is somewhat relative, but um, yeah, if you feel you need to stop, uh, stock up on gold to barter with aliens, just press on. Uh, it, it's, <laughs> it's not necessary to, necessary to do something like that. I think that's probably a misnomer. Um, unless you have to locate some aliens that have a big need for gold. Okay. Uh, that's about the only reason you'd have to do that. Uh, again, you won't need all that stuff very soon anyway. So it's kind of a moot point. Okay, and then I was just wondering if you could give that just for a vow again. Now go ahead. Why don't you give it this time? Uh, P.O. Box 481. Uh-huh. Yelm, Y-E-L-M, Washington, 98597. Okay, I think that answers all my questions. Thank you. But you're not connected with the Jay-Z Knight down in Yelm? No. Okay. No, that's just where my post office box is. All right. Just wanted to clarify that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the call. Steve in Lacey. Hi, thanks for joining us here on 570 KVI. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if he could elaborate on what he thinks of uh, Merlin, the legendary character. I've come up with a, a few theories of my own as far as uh, Merlin goes, of being a time traveler and such. It seems how... Uh, uh, books tend to indicate that he was uh, rather helpful in the building of Stonehenge and had something to do with the, these giants. You got it. <laughs> that was it? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Oh, but he wanted you to elaborate on that. Uh, I don't know if I can really elaborate too much more on that at this point in time, but uh, he's, he's essentially correct. Okay. Uh, can you uh, maybe uh, say a little something about uh, the purpose of the pyramids? Purpose of the pyramid. Well, see, I, I tend to think that they were uh, originally had, you know, the, the electric uh, capabilities. Uh, that you know, my theory is that they were originally used for uh, the deflection of uh, the asteroids. Um, my theory is that's they were not exactly correct, but you are intuitively latching on to something else that they were involved with. The pyramids basically uh, were created uh, by Thos. Uh, the three pyramids in Giza and the, all the other ones are laid out in the Fibonacci spiral. Fibonacci, isn't yeah, it? Fibonacci spiral. Mm -hmm. um, the pyramids were initiation areas. Uh, if you uh, compute the, the path of uh, energy within a pyramidal structure, you have two Fibonacci spirals, one positive and uh, white uh, electrical, and you have a negative black magnetic. So and they went through different points uh oh, we're getting up to that break time again. But we'll continue. I guess basically you're, I'm sensing that this is going to be kind of an energy battery of bioelectric or magnetic energies. Right. We'll hear more about it when we come back. We'll start off with those pyramids and get the full explanation from Val Valerian when we come back. And we'll continue. It's like the entities. Uh, you, you talked about entities being drawn from other dimensions and injected into human consciousness and things like that. Yeah, well, I'm, I, I'm eventually here I'll end up getting into it. Uh, <laughs> there are... You know, what I wanted to talk about, there, we already talked about the first level of psychosocial aspects, okay? Uh -huh. That's the cultural one. Now we're going to start moving up. There's four of them that I discuss in the book, and I, I kind of like to get in because I think it will really spark a lot of memories for people here somewhere. Go ahead. But uh, it'll take a while, so I want to make sure that the calls are will permit that. Oh, okay, well. so you, you haven't, have you ever run into these people since you have such similar material and discuss this or yes this oh, really yeah. is similar to Scientology oh yeah it's really well you know he uncovered a lot of stuff uh, and a lot of stuff and like the book um, well how can these people practicing Scientology are just also weird and vicious well, the, and like I said it's Hubbard, uh, Hubbard uh, uncovered a lot of material that undoes a lot of the uh, mind con mind uh, control imprinting that's done culturally and uh, that's why they wanted him to uh, participate in their mind control programs and because he refused they started um, uh, injecting other people into uh, his close-knit uh, uh, group of friends which 
formed Scientology, as it were, in that manner, and basically subverted everything Hubbard was originally trying to do. Yeah, so that's why he went underground. Up with, pardon? That's why he went underground and disappeared. Nobody well, yes, it. that's part of the reason. But I mean, it basically. But you're not advocating it. joining present-day Scientology, no, I would hope. Absolutely not. No, it's the, right. it's the basic it's, knowledge. It's too poorly the mind horror of Scientology is very different from yeah. what we're talking about. Okay. But a lot of the information you uncovered, as you will see, is very, very applicable and, and bears itself out. Hmm. Uh, at least in my, in my experience, it does. Hmm. Anything else, Shane? Yeah, I had one more Go aside ahead. here. Go ahead. Uh, a lot of these programs I listen to, they have trigger words that trigger my memories of my own experiences with these uh, so-called folks or whatever. Mm -hmm. And yours was, uh, you started talking about things underground or something, I can't remember. But in 88... NASA broadcast on, let's see, well, they put out this thing through their public relations department that they're accepting ideas from the general public on how to establish a moon base. <laughs> that's a laugh. They've already had one. Or well, that's, that's exactly what my question that was. Part of their, that was part of their the their idea that I came up with, uh, it, and it wasn't a normal thought process. It, it did evolve over a period of weeks, but... I got nauseous and a lot of other things as his memory progressed. But what I came up with was an, an underground moon base for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you know, amazing the way well, it might, it might that have this evolved. Exactly. I was wondering if you'd heard anything like that. Is there a, an underground facility up there? or? Yes, there is, on the yeah. far side, yes. On the what side? On the far side. You see, oh, the, the far side. On the part of the program, you know, Alternative 3, that whole idea... Uh, is probably somewhere between 60 and 70 percent correct in many aspects. What's alternative three? Uh, where they where they decided that they they wanted to gather the elite together with with a little help from alien technology and leave the planet and leave everybody to their doom. doom. Yeah. Oh, is this a recent thing? Uh, it's been occurring for about the last 30 years. What they discovered, what they've recently discovered, is that. When there is a, uh, a planetary axis shift, it doesn't just occur on Earth. It occurs on all the planets. That's kind so of all their, all the their stuff on the moon and Mars and everywhere else, they had to go throw that out. Now they're, faced with, now they're starting to be faced uh, on those levels with the reality of what's really going on. And, and so now there are a lot of power struggles on a lot of levels grappling at this particular I mean, some of the people are getting it and some aren't, and so there's a lot of internal conflict about yes, what to do. There's a lot of internal Kind of so they might just uh, implode from within? Uh, well, I mean, they've set themselves up for that, haven't they? Well, if they're really getting it and they're going, well, consciousness is the key here, you know, why aren't they out in some yoga classes and why aren't they out well, I mean, that's you know, the doing light of, therapy? I mean, and the Army was, uh, the Army and, and training the Psychor. I mean, they, they've got equipment that they, they've got alternate, they've got uh, alternate reality generators. They can carry around a suitcase and, and, and pull a switch and step over to the next star system. Uh, actually, no, they've got technology kind of that you wouldn't believe. Um, huh. But they, they were training uh, uh, the Psy Corps to go and do a lot of different things for military purposes, and they discovered that, you know, the more conscious these people came, the less they wanted to do all the nasty, dirty work. You know, so, I mean, it's That's the effect of higher states of consciousness. Yeah, it's self-defeating for, for a negative alignment. Um, ah. I always thought about that. I always thought that, you know, if you really knew the gifts of the universe... You couldn't possibly go out and, and be an evil person well, you'd by be the very it knowledge of it. In the end, yes. Yeah, but the very knowledge of it, it would be transforming so that you would be aligned with the implicate order. Um, it would be transforming you aligned to that. So how could you maintain a different mindset? Otherwise, you wouldn't be getting that. Yeah, it is kind of a quandary for the other side. Yeah. All right, Shane. Anything else? Well, just one more quick. Um, how do you get all this information now? Do, do, does this kind of just evolve in you, or do I think you, you get secret packages in the mail, don't you? Uh, on occasion, uh, yeah. you know, but uh, you know, this is evolving. Oh, you're serious? This, well, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, this. I get the information comes from uh, a lot of different sources. A lot of it is my own experience, which which moves through many different lifetimes. Uh, not only this one. I mean, I've done this before. Um, I, I do what I do, uh, and I've done it in different places, and this is just another place. And this is so you get this by recalling past experiences. Or well, some of it, sure, but I mean, it's not. Uh, it's 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 a lot more than that. It, it it's linking in with everything. You say there's. Uh, it's hard to really explain how so it, how it's it just, works. 
uh, you you transgress onto other dimensions. Is that a well, I think also that you, that information just flows you know, if you know, you're willing people, to see it. People know an awful lot. If people would only talk to each other and share their common experience, they would learn a lot. But they don't talk to each other. Well, as sophisticated and detailed like your pyramid ritual and things like that, people are going to be able to just talk about? You'd be surprised. Well, you know, people, people know a lot more than you think they do. Because, see, what, my feeling is that this is a very sophisticated deal going on, going on here where uh, people like Whitley Stryber and, and various folks are, are being uh, hypnotized and and programmed with this information that's very sophisticated and very uh, elaborate and detailed. And it's, I don't know, I, I, I'm kind of in between thinking, well, it well, might, I, I it know might be Stryber, UFOs right? or it might be a very elite, sophisticated group of people running around raising hell with people. And just well, there are. There, there, is, there are several different elite groups of people running around raising hell with people. Uh, and, and programming them with this type of information. I'm not saying that's what happened to you. I'm just speculating. You know, the, well, the whole there's a lot of manipulation going on yeah. uh, at various and sundry levels, uh, and, and a lot there is a lot of there are a lot of hierarchies operating here uh, with the idea of control and, and manipulation. So it's, it's really, uh, uh, really kind discern? of looking at everything and, and reflecting on your own experience. I mean, don't believe anything. I'd also caution you from joining any groups. I mean, all these people yeah. that show up at these this rally and this protest and this uh, anti-abortion well, they're, uh, getting, they're, getting in, they're just get, getting their strings pulled by some yes, hidden exactly. agenda. And they're, it's they're just so entangled. sad to see them innocently walking into being used by some force they're not even aware of. Yeah, they're getting they're getting entangled in the in the experience. They're getting drawn into the experience without having it. They're having the experience have them. I mean, if you I believe in it. anything. If you believe in something, then you're going to man get manipulated by it very, oh, very easily. And, and, and it's been said before in many, many sources uh, about the nature of belief. And, and, and it's, uh, there's one particular reference to the idea of belief. Um, I'm trying to recall what it is, but... Um, It really has to do with... Uh, oh, I know what it is. It's like uh, prejudice is a, a labor-saving device. Because if you're prejudiced, you don't have to get to the bottom of something. You don't have to research it and figure it out and think about it. Well, well so in a that's sense, part of it. Yeah. Doesn't so, this stuff don't take a lot of belief and a lot of faith? Well, no. Forget about belief and forget about faith. Okay? How can, um, how can you do that? Belief is convincing yourself of something you have yet to know and understand through experience. Because if you knew it, you wouldn't believe it, you'd know it. Yeah, and belief oh. replacing your life, okay. your attitudes, and your trust in something which has not founded itself in truth within your being, which causes you to be vulnerable. Uh, in that state of vulnerability, you can be manipulated, accursed, damned, or can lose your life, all because of belief. You have to know what it is you wish to know. You can simply do that by asking for the understanding and listening to the feelings within you about that. For example, you know, you have two armies and they're going to go at each other because one is of one religion and one's of another or one holds a certain belief system and the other is another. what's really going on. Yeah, or if they got down to the bottom line, which is, you know, isn't it better to make love than war? You know, why are they doing this? Why are they being manipulated well, one, by... One society is threatening the other with control. Yeah. Right. So I mean, they have like to establish a... control. The, the negotiations break down and they have no choice. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, there's a lot of, um, I like judgment, for instance. I mean, every being has their own way of exploring the idea of their existence. It, it doesn't mean that you have to live that way yourself, nor does it mean you have to judge the way somebody else is living as invalid. If you're busy judging what they're doing is less than what they could be doing, then you are the one maintaining those effects and those realities in your reality when you focus on them. The situation is radically different when memory is blocked by neurological factors and the constraints of being in a body are realized. Much of early human existence is consumed by frustration during the effort to, to obtain control over the body. And this, along with the focus of consciousness, being progressively focused through succeeding neurological structures in the brain as the physical organism develops, 
contributes to initial and often permanent restriction of the focus of consciousness on the body. You have the requirement for physical nourishment and the emotional habits that result from it, and you have an interesting situation. In addition, the perception is restricted through the physical senses. Thus, the process of focus of conscious awareness is turned to the dualities of pain and pleasure through the reptilian area of the brain, fight and flight, uh, flight and fight, etc. Attention is focused on the experienced events, and then the experience is retained as a habitual form of memory, aligned with a stimulus response fashion. That's what I say where people uh, uh, work through the early, the lower three areas of the brain. Emotion is an enhancer of the storage process for responses. Um, okay, which, which explains a lot of the self-help stuff out now. Uh-huh. You know, emotions are actually that storage spot. So, learning systems in cultural settings typically feature situations where fluctuating attention is cast on low-order repetitive tasks, such as road memorizing, which denigrates much of the learning that could potentially occur. These methods of learning in our educational system, more like conditioning, are held in high esteem in human existence. Virtually all uh, revolves around the knowledge, understanding, and control and application of physical matter and energy systems generated therein. This dominant yet artificial and limited system of learning operates entirely through input from the five senses and has the effect of eliminating the last vestiges of identity and self-cognition from the individual. I'm discussing the brain areas here. Right. So there are two factors which contribute to such addictions. As the entity through moves through a life in human form, many attachments are formed. The most powerful of these attachments are emotional attachments, which relate solely to expression only in time-space reality structures. This results in a compulsive need to re-enter and recycle human experience to, to complete that which has been started, as it were. And... Um, this disappears, this kind of compulsion disappears with increased levels of consciousness. But there are two factors which contribute to such addictions to human space-time dramas. The first is a functional distortion of the survival drive into the elements of body protection and maintenance as well as sexuality and reproduction. Both bodily protection and maintenance relate to the drive for acquisition of food and water followed by the drive to maintain a suitable body, body temperature, the need to keep the body safe from predation all the way from being eaten to the assault from biological organisms. Most Isn't of that just a necessity of, of existing in a three-dimensional uh, environment? From a certain standpoint, if you look at the body as, as, a, as a light body, especially on other wavelengths, it's, it's totally irrelevant. Oh, when you limit your consciousness to seeing just the physical body and not the other subtle bodies... Then, yes. then that is the arena in which you're playing, and that's the inevitable result. It's not. It's not effective in that within mm -hmm. that domain on a different wavelength, though, because mm -hmm. uh, your body is basically a light body. Right. Okay. And so, um, by far, the the largest accumulated load is the emotional mass loosely held as the human ego. Originally a primal output from the survival imprint, it generates large numbers of emotional patterns which need constant reinforcement to maintain their existence. The drive for reinforcement consumes a tremendous amount of psychic energy. The ego exploits the concept that it is needed in order for the individual to exist and achieve, that the emotion of confidence cannot exist without ego support, and that happiness is a satisfied ego. So the ego brings forth a torrent of emotionally irrational reasons to justify its existence, sidestepping the fact that emotion and irrationality are not synonymous. Uh, because of consciousness, which you are, which of, of which you're a part, it's it's not dependent on space time for its, exi its, its existence. It's inevitable that many patterns are retained when entities are no longer in this dimension. It's inevitable with a what? Um, Your last sentence? It's an in, it, it is an in, inevitable that many patterns are retained when entities are no longer in this dimension. Patterns from previous experience. Okay. But that's actually not previous because actually when you get in Simultaneous. different wavelengths, time dimension. becomes spherical. Right. Um, it's like if, assuming you were going through day-to-day uh, -day and experience a whole day and you looked at every moment of that day as a frame in a motion picture film. Okay? Mm -hmm. And suppose you were able to do that, and suppose you jumped out of that film and laid the whole film on the table, and you could look at the whole day from a higher dimensional perspective. 
Because that is the point of view of that higher dimension. Right. You can see it all. And a lot of times people fragment um, things. When you actually perceive something, you're separate from it. The only way you can actually know something is to become it. Uh, in terms of cultural religion, um, people uh, say they, they want to know God and everything. You have to become this. And, and in fact, you are in many aspects you are a part of the creator so in order to know that you have to become it so right. uh, in a cultural level if, if all the uh, all the religions knew who they were they'd be out of a job right. uh, so it's kind of interesting there's much discussion about the idea of free will within the within a space-time format the physical nature of the human body is that it contains genetic programming in the form of behavioral and emotional patterns that have been locked into the DNA structure, which is derived from every physical body that's ever contributed DNA to the physical body that's occupied. That means yeah, your father, their father, so you're mother. So you carrying all your ancestors with you. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of reactive patterns and things like that. So you mm -hmm. have that plus the cultural programming. You've got a lot of stuff to get rid of, of and understand. So these emotional patterns place constraints on the activity and the consciousness of the entity using the body, while the consciousness of the entity is indistinguishable from body consciousness. What remains is culturally viewed as free will. The free will can be coerced. Body consciousness is composed mostly of genetic programming. This is what uh, the genetic entity, as it were, what, what responds when you do muscle testing. That's, to, that's the genetic entity, the, the total oh. consciousness of the body. The, the, the environmental and cultural programming make up the balance. So body consciousness itself is almost entirely a chemically-based consciousness, okay? And this mm -hmm. can be heavily influenced by electronics, and that's part of what the mind control thing is. Oh, I see. Okay? It's the basic consciousness of what has been referred to as the genetic entity, the consciousness of the body itself. It's not until the focus on body consciousness is broken that the occupying entity can progress in consciousness and increase perception of surrounding reality structures. You have to break that. Uh, on still a higher level of examination, you can look at the genetic program programming which exists on a cellular level within the human being and examine some of the areas of interest that relate to this issue. In the human arena, uh, the factors of mass, energy, space, and time play an important part because humans exist as composite entities, if you will, because you have to you have to have uh, you have a physical body, which is a biochemical electronic structure made up of mass, which exists in a time track occupying space, which has its own consciousness that's made up of holographic gestalt of cellular consciousness, ultimately based on DNA structures inherited from previous generations. The, the gestalt consciousness of the body can be called the genetic entity. It appears to have the highest density in the middle of the upper torso of the physical body, which can be seen as a container or vessel for the being which manipulates it. As mentioned before, any event which is experienced by a human being with an emotional component is recorded on quantum levels within the genetic structure on a cellular level. In truth, experience is recorded along with emotional patterns associated with that experience. Mental pictures are also recorded. Many times experience may include periods of physical pain or periods of unconsciousness associated with physical injury or emotional trauma. You could be watching, uh, watching a baseball game and get a headache, not realizing that part of the genetic memory in your genetic pattern includes somebody who inherited part of the, D who uh, used part of the DNA in a previous body that got hit in the head with a baseball. Oh, okay. so you're saying that even we we tend to attach reasons that would make sense to us to our experience when in fact it may have nothing to do with it. It may have nothing to do with our specific right. experience. I mean, there's right. a lot of things to go through, mm -hmm. and these memory traces are very often held at specific points on the time track of the physiological structure in which they occur. So, so what do you mean? So when you hit this moment in your life, boom, that's going to happen, regardless of that all other input. Could very well be so. Yes. Okay, so that's why people who are doing past life regression, uh, you hear the story frequently that, well, when I turned 22, then this thing manifested, and I go back and I found that when I was 22 and in past life, the same situation had its point of origin. Like that kind of yeah. idea? Okay. Uh -huh. so, um, so, also memory traces and the accompanying emotional patterns that are inherent in the genetic entity manifested through the reactive mental gestalt can be re-stimulated into manifestation through external influences, which is what you're saying. 
So the external influence could manifest itself through environmental factors or even on an albeit technical level through implant devices or patterns overlaid with, within the physical body or within the field surrounding the physical body as higher density implant patterns ingrained in the electronic interference ridges between your auric bands. And this is getting into very technical stuff, but I'm putting it out there anyway. Research indicates the substantial evidence that this is a commonly applied method of manipulation. Um, it's apparently uncommon for the genetic entity to host the same occupying spiritual component twice. And this appears to reflect the overall tendency within the operative manifestation of the universal intelligent matrix for, manif for maximization of experiential differentiation. I I'm, I'm, know I'm using a lot of big words, but I really can't describe it any other way. Well, I think we can handle it. Allowing genetic structures a plethora of controlling host entities. In other words, you as a spiritual occupying entity in a specific body and genetic line you're in have never lived before this lifetime, you see. You're unique to this moment, but you are... You've never lived connected. this particular lifetime before. Mm, I see. So the genetic entity apparently enters the protoplasm line some two days to a week prior to conception. Since the genetic entity appears to answer in present time through muscle testing in a dual manner when queried through muscle testing and other methods, it's suspected that the genetic entity is in fact a double entity where one side enters via the protoplasm and the sperm and the other through the protoplasm and the ovum. Hmm. Um, an interesting aspect of the combination of genetic entity and occupying spiritual entity is that there seems to be some evidence that both components of the, compo uh, the composite human being carry facsimiles of the memory of each other, producing multiple facsimiles of past deaths for the same period of linear time. Interesting. We're coming up to that break. That was Val Valerian reading from his book, Matrix 3, was it? Yes. And we'll continue when we come back. Do you want to spend some more time with us? Oh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting things to cover. And we have a lot of phone calls yeah. as well. So we'll let you finish on the other side. On the other 8%. Uh, there are any studies? Uh, Runs them through some chemical analysis. Supplied by Canadian British suppliers include in your cigarettes, hey, I don't shellac, know. acetone and turpentine, acetyl aldehyde, and uh, 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 glyocal, which are animal carcinogens, methyl uh, um, acylicate, which causes birth defects in hamsters when given or oral or topically, licorice root containing. Uh, glyceristic acid producing cancer causing polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons when burned um, uh, catechol a co-carcinogen and a byproduct of heated sugars they use sugar to go and uh, uh, cure the tobacco if you air, air cure tobacco it doesn't do anything to you really I like and, the Native Americans. And other, and other additives uh, that strengthen the effect of cancer-causing compounds when heated. The list of additives is in the American brands is filed in the Department of Health and Human Services and protected from public scrutiny by criminal penalties against anyone disclosing it. So weird. Yeah, there's, you know, it's just, you know, one of 10,000. Well, subsidizing weird the tobacco industry. Pardon? It, which, we're, the taxpayers subsidizing the tobacco industry big time, too. Indeed. You know what? I have a can from you know, Olympia. There's yeah. even a thing where they, where they lace the tobacco paper, possibly with opium derivatives. Oh, So, really, crazy. the combination of all this stuff makes it almost impossible for people to really. Well, who in the right mind would smoke cigarettes if they knew all of this, right? Uh, because they're addicted. They don't have to be in their right mind at all. Oh, I see. Um, they're biochemically yeah. hooked in. Yeah. yeah, and of course the whole industry you know, relies on all this stuff. And, and you know as well as I do that this kind of um, perverse mental framework extends to the entire uh, military-industrial complex, the medical industry, everybody that makes a buck off. I mean, if, if the American system, medical system, was like the Canadian medical system, where the government had to pay everything, you'd bet they'd, they'd go and issue the cures for everything that they have right away instead of doing all this research. Right. I mean, so much of this this uh, airborne viral bacteriological warfare has been developed um, uh, as part of the cancer program uh, under the guise of cancer research. There's so wait, much that's wait, going wait. on. We donate to cancer programs, and instead of finding the cure for cancer, they're, they're, they're finding more um, um, that's, uh, all causes this, of all cancer. All this has been absolutely, completely documented. There's absolutely no <laughs> doubt whatsoever that all this is going on. I mean, there's, there's so much. And then you have the, the, 
besides the fluoride gambit and all that, you have the immunization, yeah, the immunization gambit. We've covered that's that. That's an entire different, you know, that's, that's another thing. Um, and all the, the other, you know, using covert research and biological weapons for population management, uh, the stuff that's been going on at Fort Dietrich, e Dietrich even other than AIDS. Um, Oh, oh, I understand that that's the place where the AIDS virus supposedly was invented. You know what? We have a caller who's been um, uh, calling from Olympia that we should take okay. for just a moment. Kenton Olympia. Hi, yeah. thanks for joining us. Thanks for being patient. You're welcome. Uh, Val. Yes. Uh, there's, a, there's a book uh, called Illusions by Richard Box, one of my yes. favorite ones. And there's a quote in there, the mark of your ignorance is of your belief in injustice and tragedy. Yeah. And through your experience, uh, one of my challenges right now is to uh, is looking at that and, and um, congratulations with with being of service. Uh huh. Not so much with judgments, but just being of service. Well, you know what judgment is. Uh, Do you understand what the idea of judgment for is. For me, it means pre prejudice or prejudgment. Well, you know, it's really uh, choosing what you prefer. Uh -huh. Choose what you prefer and let everyone else have the right to live the way they want to, knowing that the way they live has nothing to do with the way you choose to live and will not affect you if it is not what you prefer. Preference is not judgment. Judgment is invalidating everything you don't prefer. When you invalidate something, you become equal to it, and thus what you do not want, you become. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then that's really what's behind the phrase, judge not and you should not be judged right okay it means that um, essentially you become what you hate <laughs> so uh, <laughs> haven't you seen that happen to people and institutions and well, isn't that an interesting paradox of it's human people are dynamics it's conditioned to it I mean if you go into uh, the educational system which is another entire issue on a cultural level you'll see all the little 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 ego games and all the stuff that children are uh, uh, encouraged to play and you know it, it, it's no wonder that some people have a hard time in this kind of system which is entirely an artificially and synthetically created disaster for trying to evolve in this system and that's why it, in, from another interesting and rather amusing aspect it's so desirable because it puts out so much challenge if you had if you uh, we're all like the basketball players that practice in wearing rubber galoshes and, and gloves, right? I mean, well, you're not if if, if you're uh, operating in a certain wavelength where if you whatever you think of manifests itself. There's not sometimes there's not a lot of opportunity to gain wisdom, so you need to forget that and put yourself in a situation where that is not so. So the delay. An engaging experience produces wisdom, which doesn't have a polarity, and that produces truth within you, which doesn't have a polarity either. When you Everybody's say it's not a polarity, you mean it's not saying good and evil, uh, yin and yang, black and white, that kind of a polarity? Is that what you're referring to? Well, every, everybody's truth is true. But what I'm terms of, how are you using the term polarity, just in terms of well, duality? Sure. Yes. Okay. okay, just wanted to clarify that. Can't do anything else? Yes, um... Quickly, no, excuse me. So far, we've been discussing, or I've heard you discussing. Um, it seems to me the steps to to again remember or recognize within us, from a human experience to the, the Christ, which we already are. Indeed. Um, so, it, so there's really no past and no present. Everything's happening actually right now, simultaneously. Yes, from a different and from a different perspective. Yes. Uh -huh. Then Ekinkar and MSIA. Um, my understanding is they operate from bringing this energy into this level there are and bypassing all the psychic material levels or lessons as okay, far as the well there you know there there are there are a whole bunch of things out there okay a lot of different disciplines a lot of different things um, very often in the you go, if you go to a bookstore you'll see a whole in the quote unquote new age section which mm -hmm unfortunately involves things to do with consciousness um, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff and everybody will kind of be drawn to certain things and they'll find an element of their personal truth and that relates to their experience in there that might not relate to anybody else's right. 
very often a lot of organizations and individuals will incorporate, um, will put out a bunch of stuff which is actually misleading to people, but they'll sprinkle enough little key elements which will be recognizable as personal truths by individuals that, that, that in. people tend to take lock, stock, and barrel and take everything else without really reflecting on those items which they recognize in whatever they read that resonate with their experience and their own personal truth, and that's the, all they have to pay attention to. They don't have to believe in anything and pay attention to anything else, only their own experience. This is the whole key to it. That's a good point. So, I mean, so there's a lot out there, and you can find, you know, your personal truth in anything and, and a part of it out there, and all of them are correct. Right. But that doesn't mean the whole package is correct so look at everything in, on an ad hoc basis well uh, you know don't that's, take that's true packages. from one perspective but again the per, you know the individual who prepared the package that may have not truth. done it, mm -hmm. it may have not done it in, in a for a reason mm -hmm. of misleading anything purposely they may in fact totally have ingrained that into a grid work and a belief structure within their consciousness and that's how they view reality which is perfectly true yeah. for them but it doesn't mean that it, that just because another person doesn't see it that way in that perspective it's not true i mean yeah. you have the idea of um, somebody in the dsm3 who is considered in a cultural format as being psychotic okay or what makes them psychotic is they are seeing another reality but they are totally unable to explain it to anybody so there's no point of reference you see Right. Um, you know, I've 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 had experience uh, working uh, 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 one summer in in the psychology thing uh, in several places like that. <laughs> that was an experience, and that was you know many years ago. But you know, I understand that. I understand it by virtue of my experience in this particular lifetime, as you must look at it linearly, and other ones on different levels. It's all there. Do you feel that the only really true service we can be is in clearing ourselves of our illusions? Well, uh, illusion is a, is a matter of perspective, I guess. But within the terms that you're saying, that I, I would say that's a fairly well a good place to start. Yeah. A plate and a skull. And so you have a five-fold standing wave pattern of theta lower tachyons which interact with the liquid crystal structure of the brain matter uh -huh. and that part of the brain structure that matches the frequency of the vibrating tachyons will respond via harmonic resonance and the tachyons which enfold energy will provide deltons which in turn create uh, uh, antimatter not antimatter but there's another there's a higher a different pre matter stage of matter antimatter A-N-T-E and matter simultaneously oh and so, anti being that little uh, uh, that means not antimatter not the opposite right that little uh, suffix that means precedent right anti okay and so electrons are formulated and electric pulse flows giving rise to a perceived thought so this can be simulated electronically okay so the mm -hmm. human brain in essence being a biological receiver and a transducer of thought energy right uh, is a masterpiece of sacred geometry, chemistry, alchemy, and structural engineering. It's constructed in five major hard bone plates uh, interconnected by membranes, okay? And the, the cranium is a superb, superb transducer of linear and nonlinear complex vibrations. And here we're getting into the psycho, psychoactive components of electromagnetics. So these complex vibrations can also be called conjugate because they have both three-dimensional and hyperspatial components. So the natural resonant vibrational frequency uh, of the cranium uh, is in a range of 840 to 890 megahertz in non-hertzian vibration. Unfortunately, an externally applied hertzian wavefront of the same frequency can and does make the cranium undergo resonance due to entrainment. So they only need 10 to 20 percent power mm -hmm. coherence to do this. So they pull you off your higher potential and entrain you by setting up like a tuning fork that you're going to start vibrating at this other frequency right. so they draw you off. So partially, you with, really be partially with the help of uh, alien technology over a period of time, mm -hmm. government scientists can now duplicate the nonlinear, random, non-Hertzian wavefronts of thought, the so-called thinking process, and they can shut that down on people even. 
where the adequate modifications of RF and microwaves, they can, inter, uh, they can induce vibrations in the cranium, access the neural lattice in the brain, and implant thoughts via ELF, ULF. Thus, individuals can be impacted unless they really know themselves on a deep level and, to think, override it's that own, program. and think it's their own thoughts they're perceiving. Okay, so so we so um, you know there's there's a relationship in sacred geometry between the constants pi and phi, with the way that uh, the cranium is con that uh, is constructed. The actual process of transductions of theta waves involves the ionic crystalline structure of the calcium bone in the in the cranium. Right, with this crystalline structure, right? The ionic structure in in effect forms a phase space embodies a 12-dimensional tensor field between the electron shells and the incoming theta waves are held in micro-unified fields within, within these crystalline structures. Resonance is established and theta waves come down into mass whereupon electrons are generated. That's why <laughs> copper has an effect on some of these because the, the molecular and atomic structure of copper mm -hmm. has a, a, a tetrahedral structure which actually mm -hmm. has hyperspatial components. And this is why copper is an effective shield against certain hyperspatial and electromagnetic uh, things. It's so wearing a copper bracelet? ELF, though. ELF is mm -hmm. a magnetic. Um, what about a lot of other devices that you hear about that are supposedly going to protect you from uh, electromagnetic frequency? I mean, I know people that wear mandalas of uh, the rainbow spectrum with 12, looks like a 12 flowered uh, petaled lotus. Um, just the picture of it, apparently. I know people that wear a te uh, Tesla watches, not Tesla technology, but something similar. People well, that wear ceramic you know, chips that are, you know, there's all sorts of devices out there. I'm, sure, looked a into I'm sure a lot of people will recall sometime during their life going down in some inner city area and seeing some poor soul with a piece of aluminum foil over their head for no apparent reason. I I'm sorry, could you repeat <laughs> that and, and talk a little louder? I'm sorry. I, I said I'm sure people remember sometime in their life going down to some inner city, inner city area seeing some poor soul with aluminum foil over the head for no apparent reason. Oh, I see. Uh, They're know. just using whatever they can to try and shield this. There's some things that you can do, I guess, uh, to, to deal with it on that level. On that level, yeah. You can tell us what they are? Well, again, it's... Just uh, briefly. Again, it has to do with... Um, uh, basic, uh, you know, some of the devices that you're talking about, you know, I, I suppose in terms of consciousness of a person has a belief structure which supports that. Uh, then oh, I see. So you can activate your own okay, yes, belief structure. Yes, unknowingly, mm -hmm. when the device really has nothing to do with it, it's the fact that you're focusing yeah, that's on your consciousness. Right. That's the same function that people, when they when people externalize their higher element out there and call it something else uh, of a higher nature, when in fact it's themselves, and when they that when they address it, when they focus on it, they really don't realize what they're actually doing. Um, I mean, oh, I see. See, there, there's yeah. a lot of different things that are going on simultaneously. And if you're really not aware and you don't understand the whole picture, they're going to get you coming and they're going to get you going. Indeed. Dan, anything else? Well, I had uh, two more questions if, if I can get them in. Now, one was uh, I wondered if you uncovered anything to substantiate Admiral Byrd's uh, Oh. Stories about the hollow earth and stuff. Thank you. That was on my list. Uh, was it? Yeah, go, I'm glad you asked that. You have a list? It, it, Me? Yeah, I'm just not being able to get it in. Okay. It, it just seems like it's, it's one of these vague mysteries that, that, that you know, it's like, uh, it's kind of like a Damsky where it's, it's still a question mark and nobody well, can prove or disprove it. Um, for planetary bodies to be hollow is, is no small uh, e? surprise. I mean, uh, the... Um, even within terms of cultural empirical science, they've, they've uh, come to the conclusion that a lot of uh, planetary bodies and moons are hollow. Yeah. And um, there's certainly no reason to really, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, it is very well the case. Um, and the crust of the Earth is some 700 miles thick. Yeah. I mean, and how far has anybody drilled? Right. Um, so, I mean, it's uh, relative to the so-called Admiral Byrd diaries that are out there, those uh, are apparently not, in fact, a uh, true account of what transpired. But um, I would say that that's a very likely 
case. Uh, it's it's part of the structural component components of uh, planetary creation, the way planets are created. But you think his accounts are not totally accurate? No, I think there was a there was a, something that was put out in the last couple of years that was reported to be Bird's diaries. Mm, yeah. They were just doctored up a little bit, in your opinion? Well, quite a bit. I mean, mm -hmm. they were put out because somebody desired to make some cash from it. Yeah really more than anything else. Yeah. Do you think anybody got to his wife and that's why she has never spoken out about this one way or the other? Um, I, in, in this moment, I have no knowledge of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about that. The, the only other question I have, and this is something that's bothered me for a long time, and, and that is that now, um, okay, you made the statement that whatever, whatever a person perceives to be real is real, then then wouldn't that open the door for any and all charlatans out there who just want to sell a theory like, like, oh, oh I'll give you an example now. I, I don't believe that in this Ramtha channeling thing as being valid. Now, it may be, but I don't believe it. Okay. But I'll just use that as an example. And you know as well as I do there's a lot of charlatans out there trying to sell books and stuff. Okay. So how do you correlate the two? Right. How can you say that the guy that published the uh, his own account of Admiral Byrd's records was out to deceive the public, make a buck, or you know, can you say gee, that was his special interpretation? You know what I mean? You got to use some discernment here. Yeah. How do you how do you use discernment if if every perception is reality? Well, or again, someone's reality, again, maybe every, not yours. Again, every if you perceive something, then you're separate from it. It's only if you become what you perceive, then you can actually know what it is. Um, relative to birds, that bird diary, I, I have personally have no evidence within my experience that supports that. Yeah. So it's a, it's an opinion. Dan, I hope that answered your questions. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate your call. Okay. Shane in Seattle. Hi. Your turn on 570 KVI with Val Valerian. Hi, Laura. Um, Hi, Shane. Hi, Val. Um, I had two groups of questions. I don't know um, how much time I have. But Better hurry. Yeah. Um... I want to know basically what the person's personal experience when the uh, when we shift from the third to the fourth dimension will it be a gradual thing or will it be snap and will all be changed or how will that take place on a personal level? Well, on a, in my experience, having been through such a thing before, um, it happens but in both ways. It, it, it begins suddenly, but it takes about. Um, three days to to entirely complete itself. I had a, I had a question. Um, do different people, like say a certain group of the population, go through it, and then some people go through it slower? Um, it used to be a situation where some people went through it uh, because they were a certain resonant frequency, and other people did not. Uh, apparently that's no longer going to be the case because of this particular situation at this timing. Uh, so everybody will go through it. And for the people who go through and the people are still back here, what will it... There, there will be no people still back here. Not on this wavelength. Oh, but what will be here? Um, Animals, plants, rocks? Uh, there'll, there'll be... Uh, uh, some life form, life, some life forms here. That, I mean, the, the rocks will be here, the planet will be here, uh, but there will not be any life in this frequency on this planet. When we'll we all be shifted. When we're in the um, the fourth dimension, everything's shifting in and out all the time. And, and as this time goes on, you're going to have, and it's plainly in evidence, um, different dimensional doorways, for lack of a better expression opening and closing all over the place. Will the, um, new, will the new reality be a physical reality like yes. it is here? Yes. But It'll be at a different will, wavelength. But what will be the mm -hmm. difference? What will we be able to receive as a difference if it's a physical reality just like this one? Um, you will be able to perceive the difference as being whatever you give thought to manifests itself. Also have a little more latitude with which to create a reality. Right. So to speak. Now and we're coming go, up to the... If you go there in an area with a lot more latitude and you're very chaotic and, and uh, of a negative alignment, you're going to actually align yourself with a different frequency after a very short period of time and disappear from that one. So in a way, it's... You're going to reap what you're going to sow. It's self-cleansing. Uh-huh. 
this what about all those people that, in the school? What about all those people that talk about the earth changes, you know, and they show the map of Seattle with its uh, underwater? I mean, you could say in a sense, well, maybe that's going to happen after we've already shifted. And, uh, They're engaging left. the drama. They're engaging the drama from, from a, a lower state of consciousness. Sure, it's going to happen. But they have to realize that their existence is not, and it never has been, dependent on any structure at all, including a physical body. If they recognize, realize who they are, then it does not matter what's going to happen on this frequency. Oh, I see. No matter what happens here on Earth, you're going to continue to exist in one form or, or another. So why be so attached to a uh, physical body? Right. They, they are and choosing to... Uh, sacrificing you know, a state of consciousness for trying to protect a body that's just going to die anyway. Well, the ego, the ego lo loves to engage experience and make drama. And yeah, to whatever like drama degree, scenes, huh? to, yeah, to whatever degree you want to in, engage experience and create drama, you can go ahead and do that. I mean, you have free will. Well, um, one more thing, Dad. On um, imprinting, do you believe that uh, to break imprinting, it is necessary through uh, uh, shock forms, such as some of the initiation rites, or, or can it just be achieved gradually through a? Uh, you know, if you look at society, and, and most people seem to be operating out of a primitive mind state, um, and, you know, some, some other people that uh, have been able to think more advanced. Uh, well, you can do it either way. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it, it's easier on the relative to the neurology in your body if you do it the easy way, mm -hmm. I mean, the soft way, as far as... Uh, inner technology way um, otherwise you throw things out of balance a little bit you know? well, you, well in that you hear about people that maybe were in uh, car crashes this or that had head injuries and or, or some severe shock and and as soon as they get out of the hospital everything about their life changes they leave their their family and they go uh, do okay, something well, that they always wanted to do and in having access through knowledge of other people's experience and in knowing that then that itself lends understanding to your own experience. You don't necessarily have to decide to go and drive into a bridge to have that. You see what I mean? Oh, I, I know. You, can, you can gain wisdom from other people's experience mm -hmm. in just knowing that. So that itself is helpful. Yeah. I just, I just almost sometimes I wonder if on a mass scale it would be nice if... Uh, we all drove into a bridge? Well, <laughs> I think that's what the paradigm shift is all about in one sense. Yeah. In, in a sense, that, uh, but not uh, actually... Yeah, yeah. That, that's what it's all about. I mean, the, the, the grid is already there. Uh, as a species, we're moving into unity consciousness, which is what you have to move into, integrate into everything else that's around here. And what you do with the unity conscious, consciousness, having free will, is up to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> David, thank you for the sure. call. Thank Appreciate you. it. We'll take a break, and then we'll come back with Val Valerian and your phone calls. I'm Laura Lee on 570-KVI. Kathy in Seattle. Hi, Kathy. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Laura, and hi, Val. Hello. Hi, Kathy. Val, did you say that your, your uh, knowledge of this after the shift um, landscape was through personal, like a little a visit through projection? Through what? Well, you might say an out-of-body trip or... No, I've been through this before uh, in other ways. I've been through a shift before. Oh, so you're... That you consciously remember? Yes. And so you didn't lose any, any sort of conscious memory in, in this term? So you've been sort of awake for a long, long time, in a sense? Yes. Uh -huh. Would you say it's... Um, so you, taught, you said if uh, some people didn't... Oh, I had my radio down. Yeah, I'm still getting an echo. Um... You said if people didn't really have it together, that they would, like, go into the into the afterwards, and then pretty soon they'd disappear into another plane. Um, it sounds almost like a like when you're recording on magnetic tape, you kind of flux it first, and then you apply the new signal. Is that a good metaphor? That people could go into one of a number of, of planes as well. Well, uh, like attracts like. I mean, you you basically resonate to a certain frequency and you're mm -hmm. there uh, in this case everybody's being everybody's being pushed as it were and where they where they stay there by how they are as uh, as in terms of being uh, 
remains to be seen. If they don't stay there, they they go to a resonant frequency that relates to how they how they are. I so mean, everybody's finding their own comfort zone, in effect, and so essentially, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that instead of there being, we're moving from here to there, there's almost an infinite amount of parallel realities that they choose from. Of course. Well, you say like, like finds like, in yeah. sense, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, when you speak of it as if it's one shift, mm -hmm. uh, you're thinking that, like, most people are the more enlightened or something? No, everyone. So everybody's Every, going to go. Everybody's somewhere. going this time. Not necessarily to the same place, though. Now, you say this time. That means that there were other times when there were only certain certain uh, beings that made the shift? And was it yes. just here on Earth, or was it in the solar system? Was it universal? It's been elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So Earth isn't the only locale of this? No. I don't think so. A lot of people are sort of a mixed bag of, like, non-integrated collections of beliefs. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> which... Nothing personal here. Which one um, would uh, dictate the end location? Like the most powerful one or the most imprint level one? Well, uh, whatever beliefs, uh, whatever uh, structures your, the way you are, the way you are as a being, okay, which also structures what you do. Now, if you live in a state of mm -hmm. fear all the time and, and when thrust into the unknown, see, the whole thing, everything involves making known something that's unknown, okay? And that involves consciousness and it involves you as an individual. Nothing worth doing. If you look back on your whole life here, nothing worth doing, you will recall, involves something that was known, it always involved something that was unknown. And it pushed you into a situation, one way or another, upon retrospect, in which you evolved in understanding about something, hasn't it? This is no different. Hmm. So that the new change, you might say, is one more, one more piece in a pattern which has been recreating all along. In a well, all, it is well is, all, there, all it is is change. That's all there is. There's and then great, once we live on that uh, level for a while, then we're going to make a shift to the next one. Right. After and, so and, long. and if you're if you're a, a, a slave to the cultural programming of resistance to change, for lack of no other reference point, because it's been programmed to be so, then you resist every change in your life. And, and, and think of things in general terms in retrospect, if you must view the past in that way. And, and reflect on that, contemplate that. Well, also see it as if you're in the ocean riding out a big wave, you might as well be surfing at the crest of the wave, you know, and getting a good view, uh, than being pummeled by the wave at the bottom. You know, I mean, you've got a choice where you want to be within the wave pattern. Right, it's simply a different view. Yeah. Unless you're a captain. One's a hell of a lot more fun than the other. It depends on what you prefer. Ah. Some people would like the tunnel and have their pictures published everywhere. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I guess that's true because a lot of people, I mean, I, I know a few drama queens out there that can't live through the day unless they invent some big, <laughs> heavy drama in, in which to play out and be the star of it in their own little soap opera. I mean, I've met people like this, and it's like you shake your head and you go, well, it's just not my story well, line they're, here. Well, they're growing, you know, they're growing in understanding, and, and, yeah. and that's fine. So even though you've been talking about this major shift, um, from your latest description, it sounds like really not that much more of a change. Uh, you've been through one, you've been through them all, right? <laughs> well, in, in <laughs> essence, it's, it's, it's going to be something that's very enjoyable uh, in the final aspect of it, yes. Oh, you mean after this 2023? The only thing that makes me sad, though, is the yeah. thought that this is a beautiful three-dimensional Earth. You know, all, it's such a all jewel. Of is, all of this is already there. It's sitting there. It's there already. Okay. It's sitting there, ready. Is your Matrix 3 book available in most bookstores? Uh, well, in, in Seattle, it's, um, it's available at a couple bookstores that I don't recall. As reflections, I think. Uh, 
is one of them, and East West. Oh, you were telling me East West. East West. Another. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, so was another one. That's good to know. And East West is on Roosevelt and 63rd or some yeah. something like that. Kathy, thanks for the call. Thank you, guys. Shane in Seattle, boy, did you have to go to the back of the line when we didn't quite uh, get you on the phone? Yeah. Um, okay. I was there. Welcome back. Talking and you couldn't hear me. Oh. Okay, well, could that's... you speak up a little bit? Well, you're, you're you're in the front of the line if everybody else reverses themselves. Yeah. Okay. Um, my other question to my the one I had first was, um, you're talking about all the. Um, I basically want to know who are the forces behind. Um, you know, all the manipulation. I mean, is it a government? Is it an alien race? I mean, give me an idea of who or what and what their motivation is with all this. Well, it's, it's a multi-nested hierarchy of control. The, 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 uh, if you must look at in polarities, the ultimate uh, negative polarity is just totally align with aggrandizement of the ego in human terms um, you know you know there are uh, uh, I go this gone into very well by Michael Topper uh, what's the name of his book again it's in Matrix 3 oh his material he wrote an article and it's in Matrix yes. 3 okay uh, he goes into that very much but, but in a nutshell uh, you have different factions aligned in the negative polarity and some of these factions are at different frequency or at different wavelengths and partially they're, they're desirous for control and manipulation to, to the degree to which they lack the spiritual component overlap with other factions degree uh, other factions uh, um, processes of manipulation and control so you have a multi-nested hierarchy so there's like a confederation of those that are working against life force and the they're confederation not, of those that are working so with much, you? They're not so much working against one as they're working for the other. For How would you describe for what? For control, for manipulation? For control and manipulation. That's why mm -hmm. some species uh, enjoy the idea of stalking. You know, there's different... The, the what do you mean stalking? Stalking. S-T-O-C-K or S-T-A-L-K? A-L-K. Okay. Um, you know, a different... Uh, some mental formats and cultural formats of some species are really, really different. Like what? Like, give an example. Um, well, in the, in the idea of stalking, perhaps, uh, is a good example. Um, just for the enjoyment uh, of... Uh, Stalking another species. That, that the hunt, right? The hunt. A sport. Essentially, from a different perspective. Uh, just for the sake of doing it, not necessarily for any particular end object in it other than itself. Mm -hmm. But feeling the, the predators, <laughs> feeling powerful over the prey, that kind yeah. of, a, of a hit. Okay. Yes. It's, that partially is because they themselves are working in their lower brain structures. It's a modification. It's a negative orientation relative to the herd mentality, oh, okay. the hierarchy. You see, they're working in their, their lower brain structures too. They may be totally logically minded, left-brained in orientation, and have no emotional component of compassion and empathy mm -hmm. that functions in their society. And there are many societies like that that are just totally logical, and and uh, they're just all intellect. And. Uh, you know, we could they, say our own society is veering towards that, that we praise the intellect above all else. And, and, uh, yeah, that's part, that's, it all comes from the, the uh, integration of that specific species from Mars. I see. A long time ago. That's, that's when the, otherwise this whole planet would have developed on a female right-brained. Which one you... Well, if it was a whole long time ago, how come we had for so long, up to about 6,000 years ago, a very uh, agricultural, mother, goddess, uh, female-type uh, society, agrarian societies? It, it, but, the, but the Mars thing came in a long time ago, but yet we've had this female-dominant... Because the civilization uh, evolved to the point where you had uh, a different mode, uh, specifically the... You know the industrial type situation, which was patriarchic, patriarchic uh, uh, controlled. Mm -hmm. 
so you know that that basically that format took over because that was involved with a major expression and manifestation on this level of the power control mode. And was it just manifesting, as we can document in our in our uh, archaeological record, six thousand years ago, or was it much earlier? Or did it go intervals? Did it flip flop? There have been many different civilizations on this planet. Right. Uh, it's, it's manifested itself uh, many times. Many times. That makes more sense, yeah. Shane, one last question do you have, or I'm going to move on? Um, I just had I wanted to ask one reassurance. So no matter what any you know species or, or government does, they have no power of affecting um, the... The outcome. The shift? No. That they're totally powerless no matter what they think? Yes. Okay, good. Hey, thanks. best news I've heard this decade. Yeah. It's Jim in Seattle. Thanks, Shane. Jim in Seattle. Hi, thanks for joining us. You're on 570 KVI with Val Valerian. Good morning. Mm -hmm. I only have one simple question. Uh, how does he relate to, or, or how is he related to his creator? How am I related? Yeah. In what, what manner do you, it's like, are you the same as he, or... Are you trying to to reach? Are you are you a devoted Christian, and you're asking from that point of view, Jim? No, no. It's just okay. a matter. It's like if he, everyone has to be created from something, and so is he going to? Is he trying to reach the same level? I have always existed. Okay, so you were never created. I have always existed. And so have you. Okay. It just well, depends on whether you have a body conscious orientation and you have a, a separation in that mode. There are many different modes of, of dualism present in the consciousness on a cultural level. It depends on from what area you're speaking. But to answer your question, you know, the creator is part of what I am. I hope that answers it, Jim. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate that. What's the end result? So we go through, I mean, it, the universe... Is it continually evolving on some sense yes. so that uh -huh. we're continually, I mean, it's always going farther out in front of us than, than we right. get there, so it's just one long, big, happy journey. A one long, interesting journey. One always long journey. interesting. <laughs> yes. um, we have about ten minutes left, and I thought I would just hand it over to you and say there must be something that you want to bring up or some story you want to tell us or share with us. Something I'd like to bring up. <laughs> There's always so much. There's so many different things to discuss on so many levels. I, I, I think that uh, for those of you who have been listening uh, tonight or this morning, that uh, all this has given you a lot of food for thought and that uh, you realize that there's a lot more to what's been going on that you may have thought and that this may have confirmed your suspicions uh, about some of the things that are going on and that uh, hopefully uh, this conversation this morning has kind of broadened your horizons to where you're, you're stopping and contemplating really who you are and, and what your particular universe is, as it were is about and what your existence is about and there's, there's a lot more there to it uh, and uh, the, the final word I think I really have to say that uh, uh, love is the answer uh, and not any, any flower flower child 60's uh, cultural format in which I say that but literally as, as a reality and as a major way to focus consciousness to accomplish anything that is the major factor uh, that's really uh, what I could say to really cap that off. Dream than a dream. You get that sense, don't you? Like it's not quite the resolution is off or something on this side. Well, it's not yeah. quite laid down. It's like a color print that's off, you know, degree or something. Well, people, you know, people in their own way suspect that everything is off, but they can't quite put their finger on it because they don't have the reference points. And this is one reason why we are doing this show. And, and one reason why you do what you do, and you do it well, is because it does put that out there to people who are becoming more and more predisposed to change and wake up and become more conscious. I guess so, because I can't believe I'm getting away with this. 
<laughs> there you go with beliefs account. <laughs> I don't actually believe that. I'm just saying you know it facetiously. Well, it's, what it, it's not really a matter actually, of getting away weird. with anything. This is the whole thing. Yeah. Because truth is truth, a basic truth, as far as easily recognizable uh, within people. I mean, the the functions of consciousness and, and, and mass and energy and, and, and light and sound and, and everything else are basic to everything. And, and uh, the people that, you know, there are, there are factions within the, the apparent controlling areas in this culture that understand a lot of this and they don't particularly agree with the things that are going on now. I mean, in certain terms, all the cultural stuff about all the, all the election stuff and all that is becoming very transparent to people, but they don't quite know what to do about it. You know, I mean, who right. do you vote for? It's obvious we're being manipulated, but then... Yeah, and again, to vote is to say, yes, govern me, you know? What, mm -hmm. And there's no provision in the cultural setting for a situation where people become start becoming responsible and autonomous. So do it on your own. Become yeah, responsible and autonomous. And gradually, when pe people begin to expand the, the political format in favor of spiritual maturity, all of this other stuff will fade. But, uh, of yeah. course, there's a limited amount of time on a linear level for this to occur because it's, you know, this, there's going to be a major shift here. So, uh, so it, get it, it together. Actually, if you're truly independent and autonomous, you don't need a government to hand you the system. You don't need a school system to hand you the means by which to waken up. You'll go out and find them. Other and cultures. You'll seek them. Yeah, other planets. You run other into them. You do recognize them. You use them. You know, yeah. They, other cultures do things very differently than this one. This is in, in terms of perspective of other cultures that I'm familiar with. This place is. A, a horrendously beautiful, which it seems sort of contradictory, but horrendously beautiful learning experience. Um, hey, being human is a hot ticket to hold these days, I guess, huh? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> We're going to go to the telephones. David in Seattle. David in West Seattle. Hi. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Hi. I could listen to this all night. Yeah, me too. Uh, me too. Way back when, your depiction of uh, the mattress springs is negative energy antennas it makes me love my futon that much more yeah well, i thought uh, of that too wood and cotton you can't yeah, go wrong with it no, nothing synthetic um well i agree with what you said earlier about belief uh, i believe in nothing but myself and once you accept an idea or model is real without experiential validation you're shutting yourself off from other possibly better models and i would indict religion and the public education system of creating so many unquestioning automatons and so well it, it's also it's also uh, creating the revolution in consciousness so it can't be all bad. It's necessary. Like we said, what we perceive to be positive and negative are simply timing factors. The timing is always perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, you know, a few hundred years ago, we would be all be tortured and <clears throat> burned as heretics for thinking and speaking you know, about this thing. What I, I guess, Val, what I'm hearing you say is something that I guess I, I came to a conclusion not too long ago, and that was, hey, I'm determined to enjoy my life, and I don't have to get angry at all the nonsense that I see around me, because in a sense, it's just all meant to be, and here I chose to be here, and I'm here to learn these lessons, and might as well make a, a, a fun game out of it rather than torture out of it. There are several ways. To, yes, that's true, but... Um, there are several ways in, in which people apparently perceive this train of thought. And, and one of those ways was expressed to me uh, this evening at the um, expo. Mm -hmm. When I began, when I was uh, asked to come up there and talk about mind control, I decided, well, here is this disaster preparedness expo, and everybody's functioning, all the speakers are functioning in the first three brain areas. Why do I have to add to the fear of the people? So I start talking about something else relative to all this, pointing out some details of it. And some gentleman said uh, to somebody else there, in reference to me, that he viewed me as being dangerous because I was ignoring all the, you know, all the other things that were going on. He obviously missed the point. But people, people may interpret. Um, uh, you know, once you've already addressed the cultural arena, if you move on in consciousness, people who are stuck in the cultural arena would interpret that as burying your head in the sand because they themselves don't understand what's going on on higher levels. And because consciousness is the name of the game, not politics. 
the apocalyptic mindset there. Yes, and that's okay, because they're making an evolutionary step. They're not wrong for doing that any more than anybody who use, uses a religion for as a tool in growth to understand their own potential as part of the creator is wrong. It's not. They're all correct. It's all a continuum of, of expansion and evolution. Uh, you were talking about giving up power by accepting the need of external replacement, and one way I have taken back my ability to control my own destiny is in the actualization of, of myself as healthy from a state of degenerative disease. Um, I was diagnosed at a fairly young age with a form of arthritis in my back and legs. It left me often immobile. And after several years of, uh, I guess, accepting my position as a slave to the medical establishment and their poisons, I affected, uh, I guess, mind control over the disease or the perception of it and eliminated that condition from my body. How long did it take you? Uh, I, I can't really say a time. It, it didn't really take an extended period of time once I, I just I d denied the fact that I was going to uh, be a slave to this anymore and, and once I, I gave up all the medicine and, and the belief in the doctor's ability to cure me which uh, basically they said there wasn't any that's why they call it the practice of yeah. medicine yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, I just uh, by blocking only practice isn't making perfect is it yeah and, uh, and I went from a, a state of just horrible pain to a uh, perfect healthiness. I've done that with colds. I haven't quite got to the, 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 the degree of a major disease, but I've done it with cold saying, I, I don't have time for this, and it goes away yeah. instantly. Mm -hmm. You just deny the fact that uh, yeah. you're going to let it be a slave to you. Um, one more thing. All the external noise you're talking about in the form of biological electronic manipulation, keeping us uh, from achieving our ultimate potential, um, would I be wise to follow what has been a long-time intuition to leave this technologically polluted society behind and move to a more pure place in the world? You don't have to do that. You're going to do that anyway. Just just to learn and gain wisdom from the experience you currently are doing. That's why you're here. Uh -huh. Just what about all consider those it as a school. What about all those people that talk about the earth changes, you know, and they show the map of Seattle with its uh, underwater? I mean, you could say in a sense, well, maybe that's going to happen after we've already shifted. And, and They're engaging yeah. the drama. They're engaging the drama from, from a, a lower state of consciousness. Sure, it's going to happen. But they have to realize that their existence is not, and they never has been, dependent on any structure at all, including a physical body. If they recognize, realize who they are, then it does not matter what's going to happen on this frequency. Oh, I see. No matter what happens here on Earth, you're going to continue to exist in one form or, or another. So why be so attached to a physical body? But they, they are and choosing to... Uh, sacrificing you know, a state of consciousness for trying to protect a body that's just going to die anyway. Well, the ego, the ego lo loves to engage experience and make drama. And yeah, to whatever like drama degree, scenes, huh? to, yeah, to whatever degree you want to in, engage experience and create drama, you can go ahead and do that. I mean, you have free will. Now, well, one more thing, Dad. On uh, imprinting, do you believe that uh, to break imprinting, it is necessary through uh, uh, shock forms, such as some of the initiation rites, or, or is, can it just be achieved gradually through a? Uh, you know, if you look at society, and, and most people seem to be operating out of a primitive mind state, um, and, you know, some, some other people that uh, have been able to think more advanced. Uh, well, you can do it either way. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it, it's easier on the relative to the neurology in your body if you do it the easy way, mm -hmm. I mean, the soft way as far as... Uh, inner technology way. Um, otherwise, you throw things out of balance a little bit. Well, you, well, in that, you hear about people that maybe were in uh, car crashes, this or that, had head injuries, and or, or some severe shock, and, and as soon as they get out of the hospital, everything about their life changes. They leave their, their family, and they go uh, do okay, something well, that they always wanted to do. And, in uh, having access through knowledge of other people's experience, and in knowing that, then that itself lends understanding to your own experience. You don't necessarily have to decide to go and drive into a bridge to have that. You see what I mean? Oh, I, I know. You, can, you can gain wisdom from other people's experience mm -hmm. in just knowing that. So that itself is helpful. Yeah. I just, I just almost sometimes I wonder if on a mass scale it would be nice if uh, 
We all drove into a bridge? Well, <laughs> I think that's what the paradigm shift is all about in one sense. Yeah. In, in a sense, uh, but not uh, actually. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what it's all about. I mean, the, the, the grid is already there. Uh, as a species, we're moving into unity consciousness, which is what you have to move into, integrate into everything else that's around here. And what you do with the unity conscious consciousness, having free will, is up to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> David, thank you for the sure. call. Thank Appreciate you. it. We'll take a break, and then we'll come back with Val Valerian and your phone calls. I'm Laura Lee on 570 KVI. I go, this has gone into very well by Michael Topper. Uh, What's the name of his book again? It's in Matrix 3. Oh, his material. He wrote an article, and it's in Matrix yes. 3. Okay. Uh, he goes into that very much, but, but in a nutshell, uh, you have different factions aligned in the negative polarity, and some of these factions are at different frequency or at different wavelengths, and partially their their desires for control and manipulation to, to the degree to which they lack the spiritual component overlap with other factions degree, uh, other factions, uh, um, processes of manipulation and control. So you have a multi-nested hierarchy. So there's like a confederation of those that are working against life force and the confederation not, of those that are working so with much, you? They're not so much working against one as they're working for the other. For How would you describe for what? For control, for manipulation? For control and manipulation. That's why mm-hmm. some species uh, enjoy the idea of stalking. You know, there's different... Uh, there's what do you mean stalking? Stalking. S-T-O-C-K or S-T-A-L-K? A-L-K. Okay. Um, you know, a different... Uh, some mental formats and cultural formats of some species are really, really different. Like what? Like, give an example. Um, well, in the, in the idea of stalking, perhaps, uh, is a good example. Um, just for the enjoyment uh, of uh, stalking another species. That, that the hunt, you, right? The hunt. A sport. Essentially, from a different perspective. Uh, just for the sake of doing it, not necessarily for any particular end object in it other than itself. Mm-hmm. But feeling the, the predator is feeling powerful over the prey, that kind yeah. of a of a hit. Okay. Yes. It's that partially is because they themselves are working in their lower brain structures. It's a modification. It's a negative orientation relative to the herd mentality. Ah. Okay. The hierarchy. You see, they're working in their, their lower brain structures too. They may be totally logically minded, left brained in orientation, and have no emotional component of compassion and empathy. Mm-hmm. that functions in their society. And there are many societies like that that are just totally logical. And and uh, they're just all intellect. And, uh, you know, because they, our own society is veering towards that, that we praise the intellect above all else. And, and, uh, yeah, that's part. That's, it all comes from the, the uh, integration of that specific species from Mars. I see. A long time ago. That's, that's when the... Otherwise, this whole planet would have developed on a female right-brained and eventually... Which you... Well, if it was a whole long time ago, how come we had for so long, up to about 6,000 years ago, a very uh, agricultural mother goddess uh, female type uh, society, agrarian societies? It, it, but, the, but the Mars thing came in a long time ago, but yet we've had this female dominant... Because the civilization uh, evolved to the point where you had... Uh, a different mode, uh, specifically the, you know, the industrial type situation, which was patriarch, patriarch, uh, uh, controlled. Mm-hmm. So you know that that basically that format took over because that was involved with a major expression and manifestation on this level of the power control mode. And was it just manifesting, as we can document in our in our uh, archaeological record? 6,000 years ago, or was it much earlier? Or did it go intervals? Did it flip-flop? There have been many different civilizations on this planet. Right. Uh, It's it's manifested itself uh, many times. Many times. That makes more sense, yeah. Shane, one last question do you have, or I'm going to move on? Um, I just had one to ask one reassurance. So no matter what any, you know, species or or government does, they have no power of affecting um, 
The, the outcome. The shift? No. That they're totally powerless no matter what they think? Yes. Okay, good. Hey, thanks. best news I've heard this decade. Yeah. It's Jim in Seattle. Thanks, Shane. Jim in Seattle. Hi, thanks for joining us. You're on 570 KVI with Val Valerian. Good morning. Good morning. I only have one simple question. Uh, how does he relate to or, or how is he related to his creator? How am I related? Yeah, in what what manner do you, it's like, are you the same as he, or are you trying to reach? Are you, are you a devoted Christian, and you're asking from that point of view, Jim? No, no, it's just okay. a matter of, it's like, if he, everyone has to be created from something, and so is he going to... Is he trying to reach the same level? I have always existed. Okay, so you were never created. I have always existed, and so have you. Okay. It just well, depends on whether you have a body conscious orientation and you have a, a separation in that mode. There are many different modes of dualism present in the consciousness on a cultural level. It depends on from what area you're speaking. But to answer your question, you know, the creator is part of what I am. I hope that answers it, Jim. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate that. What's the, what's the end result? So we go through, I mean, it, the universe, is it continually evolving on some sense yes. so that uh -huh. we're continually, I mean, it's always going farther out in front of us than, than That's we right. get there. So it's just one long, big, happy journey. A one long, interesting journey. One always long journey. interesting. <laughs> yes. um, we have about ten minutes left, and I thought I would just hand it over to you and say there must be something that you want to bring up or some story you want to tell us or share with us something i'd like to bring up <laughs> there's always so much there's so many different things to discuss on so many levels i i, I think that uh for those of you who have been listening uh tonight or this morning that uh, all this has given you a lot of food for thought and that uh you realize that there's a lot more to what's been going on that you may have thought and that this may have confirmed your suspicions uh, about some of the things that are going on and that uh, hopefully uh, this conversation this morning has kind of broadened your horizons to where you're, you're stopping and contemplating really who you are and, and what your particular universe as, as it were is about and what your existence is about and there's, there's a lot more there to it uh, and um, the, the final word I think I really have to say that uh, uh, love is the answer uh, and not any, any flower flower child 60s uh, cultural format in which I say that but literally as a reality and as a major way to focus consciousness to accomplish anything that is the major factor um, that's really uh, what I could say to really cap that off